This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, and Eventide. So get ready to rock. Maybe what you're missing is maybe not necessarily in the bass guitar territory. Maybe it's the lower end of the electrics that are missing a little bit of power, or maybe it's the lower end of even those drum room mics. Those tend to carry a lot of weight. 150, 200 even in your drum room mics that take up a lot of that lower, lower mid space. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mike Kozowski, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey Rockstars, it's your host Lid Shaw and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars. Bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Justin Francis, a multi-Grammy-nominated Nashville engineer and mixer who I got turned on to from listening to mastering engineer Kim Rosen's discography when preparing for her interview. Justin had mixed a record for Roswell Kid called Precious Art that I really love the sound of. It reminded me of Weezer with slamming drums and buzzing guitars, and awesome stacked harmonies. So I immediately emailed Kim to ask who had made it. She sent me over to Justin, and here we are. Justin mixes from his log cabin home studio in Ashland City, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. In just one week, clients can range from Andrea Bocelli to Alice Cooper, and other notable artists include top 40 bands like Little Big Town, country singers like Casey Musgraves, Ronnie Millsap, Tyler Childers, Margot Price, and Rodney Crowell. Blues legends like Buddy Guy, classic rock stalwarts like Deep Purple, punk legends like Anti-Flag, and rabble-rousers like Roswell Kid and Diarrhea Planet, streams of which reach more than one million every month. Additionally, Justin's work with bluegrassers like Special Consensus and Frank Sullivan and Dirty Kitchen earned him two Grammy nominations for the Best Bluegrass Album. Today, I'm going to ask Justin all about his studio here in Nashville, how he likes to mix a wide variety of music, and what tips we can learn for getting better mixes in our own pro and home studios. And a big shout out and a thank you also to Kim Rosen for being on the show and making the introduction. Please welcome Justin Francis to Recording Studio Rockstars. Justin, are you ready to rock, dude? I certainly am. Welcome to the Toy Box Studio, man. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's not, I mean, it's a bit of a drive, right? You got a little bit of a commute to be into, it's to a get into Nashville, right? a little bit of a hike, right? but Briley's normally pretty good. 
Um, yeah, right. You're coming down Briley mm-hmm. to get the, so get go here. down Tennessee 12, pick up Briley, and kind of scoot around the city. Um, it's kind of like the White White's Creek area and beyond, or something like that. Is yeah, that right? yeah. It's just a little bit further past that. That's really a beautiful hidden spot. So Nashville Rockstars is, sur- it's kind of surrounded by. Well, it's wrapped but in a river. I guess that's a good way to say it. It's wrapped yeah. in a river, and so there's you know so many bridges to get across the river. And it means that certain areas where the bends are kind of, you go from full on city to the other side of the river is just like countryside. Right. Yeah. Little, Pretty, little river towns. Yeah. It's kind of incredible. City is. And, um, and that area you're talking about is still like this uh, wonderful gem. And I shouldn't have said that out loud publicly on a podcast because yeah. now <laughs> yeah. everybody's going to want to move in. No, it's all, it's already, <laughs> it's like it, it, the city is just inching Closer and closer down Ashland City Highway, getting closer and closer to us, and we're just. <laughs> what are uh, there's a couple of other big things that are over there too. Uh, what's it called? There's like a a big um, old mansion or something where they do events or shows. Maybe that's closer to White's Creek. Hmm. Yeah. That. That. I'm not thing thing about. About. All right. Well. Of course, we've also only only been out there a year. Uh, it'll be yeah. yeah a year last month is when we bought the place. So. Right on. Um, so it. it's a log cabin. Yeah. Yeah. That's log pretty mortar. exciting. Yeah. I love it. Uh, I mean, it's perfect studio, right? <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about what your studio is like. Well, it's just a, it's just a mix room. Um, and it's not, not too terribly big. You know, it's, it's 15 by 25 uh, control room. You know, I can have somebody on the couch in the back doing a vocal or a small overdub, but uh 95 percent of the time it's just, you're just in there doing your jam yeah it's just just mixing um cool well we'll definitely get deeper into like how you like to mix and do all that stuff because yeah. um you know especially when you describe it as not being that big of a deal most of us are like Ooh, my studio is not that big of a deal yeah, i want to yeah. learn what you're doing you know <laughs> yeah, making right. great sound of records yeah um tell us more about like who you are and how you got started out in recording how'd you end up in nashville and where are you from uh i'm from pittsburgh pennsylvania um another River Town, City of Bridges. Um, so I grew up there, and uh, I, I got into music when when I was a kid. I mean, just like everybody else, I picked up a guitar, got into punk rock music, started playing in bands, um, went in to record with uh, a friend of ours, a classmate of ours, who he had an older brother who had gone to Full Sail, I think, and had come home and kind of was was teaching his little brother about some stuff. Um, so we went in to record with him and uh, I kind of just never left. You know, that was, that was, I was 12 years old or 13 years old. And uh, I just got so turned on to the notion of, of not having to be, not having to be out front, you know, kind of being behind the scenes, but still feeling, you know, the, the creative, impact of what you were doing, you know? Um, so we, uh, we continued that studio, um, throughout the rest of junior high and high school. And we ended up doing like 200 bands or something from the tri-state area, like West Virginia, Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. And, um, then, you know, like from there, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So set forth after high school, Um, What was that studio like? I mean, how were you guys recording all these bands? I mean, it was a Pro Tools rig. It was Pro Tools 5.4, I think, was the version that we started out with. Um, And, you know, we had no overhead. You know, it was in his parents' um, basement slash garage. And we, you know, his older brother brother showed us how to make some XLRs. And we, we would do that and we would cut grass, you know, made another $40 and bought another, you know, $40 microphone or or whatever and and just kind of built it up. And like I said, uh, eventually, you know, by, I think it was maybe senior year in high school, he had, um, he just kind of drifted out of, just kind of lost interest in it. And uh, I was playing in another band at the time. And uh, so we kind of bought his half of the stuff and took it over, you know, to somebody else's house. And, um, but then I graduated high school and I needed, uh, needed the dough to, 
to get out to Arizona, which is where I went to school. Uh, oh, did you go to Crass? I did. Nice. And um, Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences, mm-hmm. Rockstars. Yeah, and I thought it was great. It was a great program, and um, but uh, like I said, I needed the dough to to get out there and kind of get on my feet. So I had to sell, you know, all the gear that that I owned. Uh, went out there and then moved to Nashville. That's pretty wild, man. So you went out to Crass, did the school thing, then came straight to Nashville. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit of gear left, or, or nothing? Zero. Wow. Well, I actually, I mean, I think they, I think they gave you a, a laptop. I think so. I, I think I probably had Pro Tools when I when I came to Nashville. That's um, interesting because you hear people talk about the stories of like, you hear people um, make the suggestion that you know take that money for school and just go start a studio and and learn it learn it that way. But here, you know, you're telling a story of like, no, I, I was doing the studio. And I guess you felt like to get to the next level, you needed some real schooling and it was worth it to just ditch the studio stuff and go to school for a minute. Yeah. And, and you know, I don't know if that was my, uh, exactly my idea. Maybe it was my parents' idea at the time, you know. <laughs> you need I, to go I, to college. You know, yeah, I was 17 years old, you know. Um, I just wanted to get out of there, yeah, wh- right, whatever totally, that yeah. meant, you know. And it's like, yeah. oh, well, this is like, this is a way for me to not go to real college and, <laughs> you know. Um what was some stuff you remember learning at Crass? Uh, I mean, it basically it sort of solidified. I mean, you know, I had been recording all these bands for, so I'd had some experience do, doing this stuff, but actually having a, a formal explanation of what, you know, what the ratio on a compressor was or what, you know, like um, learning proper gain staging or, or, you know, just, just terms and, and what, uh, how stuff works, phase relationships actually were and, and, you know, um, kind of just made everything click uh, a little bit more and just kind of like grew the, uh, the Rolodex of, you know, information. Do you remember having a sense that like, like, geez, I seem to be sitting in a classroom and like, I'm way into this, and some people just don't seem to have a clue about what they're doing, you know? Uh, yeah. I remember that when I oh, was yeah. at MTSU, you know? There was yeah. a wide variety, and I was somewhere in the middle, but mm-hmm. there were definitely people in there who just, I don't think they knew the first thing about anything in the studio making right. a record. Right, which, like, I mean, I, ideally, that's sort of, like, that was the perfect candidate for the school, right? I mean, to... To you could go in it completely green. I'd imagine it would have been a lot harder than it was if if yeah. you had just gone <laughs> into it and not not known a thing about audio or recording or, or how a session worked or, or anything. But um, you know, it was it was sort of a, a breeze for me because you know I had I had been doing it for a while. Like I said, now do you remember going through a, pro- a little bit of a process of unlearning some of the things that you did and then just and then relearning them again? Because I, I kind of did. I, I I really embraced everything that I was seeing in school, and then I would right. kind of overdo it on my sessions with my band and then have mm-hmm. to relearn to go back to the basics sometimes. Oh, like, like trying to apply. Yeah, I'd get too what, fancy. Right. What, what, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I mean, the unlearning came a lot later, which maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but I started to – to unlearn a lot of the the kind of formal stuff um, after, you know, after spending seven years on Music Row. Yeah, exactly. Like when when you go to school sometimes and you go into the these big pro studios, everything's sort of like, got to you, you're always, I don't know, the, the bar gets set so high for what mm-hmm. perfection is and things are so isolated and stuff. And sure. we were discussing just before this, um, you know, some of the benefits of recording in small spaces um, and, you know, like you mentioned, uh, we, sh- we could talk about it again, mentioned recording an acoustic guitar mm-hmm. and drums together. And the instinct is to separate the two and get them far away from each other right. with that isolating mindset. But later you learn, it's like, why not? They're going to bleed anyway. Why not bring them close together yeah. and make sure that they sound totally in phase? Yeah, you're going to have drums in that acoustic guitar uh, if they're in the same room. So it you're going to have leakage. You may as well swing it in your favor and and have it be good leakage. You know, because something that 
always have to remind yourself is nobody's going to listen to this record with the acoustic guitar soloed. Nobody <laughs> exactly. will ever hear yeah. that version. I don't think I've ever heard, ever heard Exile on Main Street, you know, soloed yeah. by the Stones. You know, <laughs> yeah. you just hear it as one big complete thing that sounds awesome. Yeah. Boy, I'd love to, though. It would be pretty cool. <laughs> I did get to hear some of those Beatles tracks. Yeah. It was Sgt. Pepper's, right? Yeah, yeah. I was kind of floating around for a minute. I know I've got a I've got a whole hard drive full of them and they're yeah. They're so they're so cool to dig into. But I was I was a little hesitant at first to to want to dig into them, you know. Yeah, it's unravel like, oh, the mystery. That doesn't sound as great as great as I thought. Yeah, but, I know. But then you got questions like, did they really align the tape machine when they were like, you know, when somebody was like secretly yeah. <laughs> Squirreling away the track to <laughs> yeah. like a bad version of Pro Tools. They right. probably like had a multi, you know. Exactly. Or yeah, you know, like it, people were asking like, oh, how did you, how did you get a hold of the, how did you get a hold of, you know, like Bee Gees multi-tracks or, or whatever. And it's like, well, it was just some, you know, some schmo like me who was, you know, interning at a studio and was given the task of like, hey, we got to bake all these tapes and we got to transfer all this stuff. It's like, you better believe I'm going to take a copy of that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, you know, we're not working in the big studio right now, so yeah. maybe that's why. Um, <laughs> all right. So anyway, I like to ask guests when they join us on the show to uh, share an inspirational quote to kind of kick things off. You got anything that kind of gets you excited about hitting the studio or anybody Ooh. that inspires you? Inspirational quote. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I, I have just the worst memory for, for remembering um what about anybody that just really gets you excited as a producer or an engineer? Anybody you've been checking out recently? Uh, man, there's been so many uh, people that, that have influenced me in, in so many different ways. Um, I've really been digging um, Sean Everett's. Uh, oh, yeah. Sean is cool, man. He came on the show. Oh, yeah. Um, talk, to work, talk about making the War on Drugs record, yeah. which was a lot of fun. Yeah, everything. What was the stuff that you picked up from him? Like, what were some... Some things that seemed interesting to you, man. It's just just kind of unconventional. I mean, just sounds. Just uh, you, you know, I, I've never been around him. I've never seen, um, you know, like pictures of of setups or anything like that. That that um, I can speak for. But just when you put on a set of headphones and and hear a record of his, it's like you can. It's like you can picture everything, you know, so clear, but yet it's so otherworldly. Right. You know, it's just, it's very interesting, uh, very interesting listen. I really enjoyed the the last King Tough record that I made. Okay, King mixed. Tough. All right, yeah. take it. We'll have to check that out. Super cool. Um, do you have anything that comes to mind for you about records that you've either recorded or mixed where you've felt really proud about being able to get close to that? Or get something that reminded you of that, you know, like detail, but but otherworldly. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, I like to think we've all had aha moments where we, you know, like everybody's crowded around the the console and and they're like, man, that sounds so that sounds so yeah, good, happens, you know, right? like yeah. It, and I'm always trying to to push yourself to to get into an uncomfortable place or 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 you know, kind of limit yourself in some way to where something interesting like that can happen because it's not, I don't think it can necessarily happen if you don't take risks and you don't, um, you don't push yourself into, into somewhere that you haven't been before or somebody else doesn't push you there. Yeah. You have to make room for the accidents that allow that stuff to, mm -hmm. to sort of, Come, it just, uh, it just appear. Yeah. They just sort of appear out of the speakers and you're like, whoa, that sounds super cool. You know, yeah. Don't touch it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's always good when you're working with somebody too, who can make that call for you. Like there's, uh, I used to do a lot of work with a band called Living Things. Mm -hmm. Um, and Lillian Berlin was the producer on that. Yeah. And, and, um, he was good about that. Like I'd just be working on something. I would have just gone, just blown right past it. You know, I was just, I just happened to be doing something in the middle, but he would be like, Whoa, that sounds awesome right, right there. Stop. Don't touch it. Stop. Yeah. And I think, cool. All right. Take yeah. It. You know? It's it's always um so fun and, and also like it's kind of a kind of a sigh of relief happens when you know the producer that you're working for or artist that you're working for is like, No, that's great. Do 
like get get as wild as as you need to and and I'll let you know when you need to rein it back but um get get out there you know so where do you like to get out there do you like to get outside of the box to get out there or do you like to work within plug in land and and within the daw to get out there um a little bit of both i mean it depends on you know depends on where where we're at and kind of the the environment that you're at and what what you have at your disposal um you know i i know at home i i've been kind of super into running stuff out and using a lot of guitar pedals and kind of trying to interface that into yeah into um my mixes and um that's such a big win when you can do that and it's i mm. keep thinking about how like one of these days i'm going to set up my patch bay yeah you know a little an extra quarter inch patch bay that will just interface with a rack full of right. or shelves full of guitar pedals or something yeah i i had um kind of the I had this wild idea of of wanting to make one wall on in my mix room like kind of velcro and just have that be like a giant vertical pedal board that kind of everything is happening at one time uh that you would always kind of have access to and that did not happen but <laughs> I do have a you know it's like a good idea though oh uh, yeah a, a bit of a, a pedal collection that that um you know when, when in doubt, you know, just take 10 minutes and, and go down a, a rabbit hole and there's something's bound to come up. And, and yeah, one you. possibility is just having some kind of interface ready. Um, so, I, for example, I have the Little Labs PCP mm -hmm. and that thing um, I just learned from Jonathan Little will go both directions, I think. So I could actually okay. hook it up, yeah. run out to a pedal and back in again. Gotcha. Um, if I connect it correctly. And, and then maybe, you know, make it just really easy for somebody to just carry their pedal board over to, yeah you know, near the mix position, plug right in. Right. And yeah. play around I'm, with things. Because all you have to really do, Rockstars, is just route that to a new track and capture it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're um, I, I know several guys who, who literally bring just like a little, little pedal board to tracking sessions and, you know, like. Typically, they're they're used for their kind of trash mics or or kind of extra or luxury mics um, that like well, if all else. Oh, fails. I see. Not the guitar player, but maybe the producer or engineer. Engineer, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So you know, you show up and dang and, it, I thought I was cool, but now I got up my level of cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, just you know, like hey, run this fifty-seven that that terminates to you know quarter inch. Run that through you know, this hodgepodge of, of pedals and lay that on a floor underneath your snare drum, you know, but point it at the kick drum, you know, like you'll hear all kinds of stuff if you're, you run it through enough fuzz or, or, you know, whatever fuzz delay slap, you know, like it just get out there and try, try some different things. Yeah, um, that's true. I've had luck with that a little bit. Like if we're trying to add, crunchy unusual mics to the drums mm -hmm. i've had luck where i've got the headphones in and i'm and i'm playing at the kit you know yeah. sort of sound checking it yeah. and then i'll just reach over and, and we've got like the dr alien smith dirt mic oh yeah which we'll put on a um you know sort of near the kick and snare and that mm -hmm. that one mic position yeah find that and you can kind of dial in as much distortion as you like in the headphones and then the uh sans amp that was a rack in the control room but i was able to just communicate with the engineer it's like oh Let's right. just go one knob at a time and like yeah. turn it up, turn it up. Give me a little less, give me a little less of that. that. Yeah. And then you just kind of go through and you end up with something that's pretty cool that way, you know? Mm -hmm. But otherwise, a, as an engineer, I feel like you need to have those tools in the control room if you can, you know? Right. Because it's really hard to harder to make those judgments. I guess you could have headphones on out in the live room and, and have the pedal out there and kind of yeah, get it dialed. It, it makes it a little bit tough, especially just – Nashville works so quick. I yeah, like. I mean these are these are all the tricks I do on my fun records. Yeah, well, Less yeah, so I mean, on the on the uh the, the high speed like how many songs can we do by lunch records? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's hard um it's hard to kind of go down down rabbit holes when you're when you're trying to do, you know, four songs a day even. I I feel like it's hard to to, to go down a rabbit hole. Um but you know, that's um that's also a great thing about Nashville is is you you get to a place where you can you can be so quick at, at something and and you can whip up you know a, a, a an acceptable 
drum sound in 10 minutes, you know? Well, don't you ever feel like um, the pressure that's on us as engineers to be that quick mm -hmm. is ultimately, it's, it's ultimately expression of the pressure of matching the quality of the musicianship that's already that quick here in Nashville too. Like the, it, it needs to accompany that high level of musicianship. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't want to be the guy or girl that, um, that everybody's waiting on. You know, you, you don't want to be the last last person like, well, give me, I need five more minutes. I need five more minutes um, because, uh, you know, a lot of times those folks don't, <laughs> don't get the call back. Five minutes is really 50 minutes. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. Also that. Um, but yeah, it, it's amazing um, how, how quickly everybody can, can get from, from point A to point B. Recording Studio Rockstars Academy is the place you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSona Studio One, Reaper, or anything else. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now, or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Well, let's talk about, um, you know, sh see if you've got a story maybe you could share about. So, so, so you went through, you know, you kind of, you came to Nashville, you've been through some Music Row, and um, now you have your studio. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any stories you want to share about like an important failure for you that became a really good learning experience in the end? Hmm. Uh, important failure. Well, there's so many to choose from. <laughs> What's a, do you have any f sort of funny, like, uh, I can't believe that happened in the studio moments? Um, knock on wood. I, I basically just embarrass yourself on the podcast. Yeah. That's yeah. Really I'm trying important. to think yeah. of just the worst thing. Um, you know, nothing is really coming to mind where, you know, again, knock on wood. I, I, nothing's ever, you know, hard drives never been deleted or, or, you know, whole, whole pro like some of those horror stories. I've uh, deleted hard drives. I've erased tape. <laughs> I shipped a box full of connectors from the studio all the way to, um, Texas yeah. without asking permission as an intern. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, I've done it all. If you need any good failure stories, just ask me, man. Yeah. Can I just borrow one of yours? <laughs> Yeah. No, the, just give me give me a little bit more time, and they'll. Uh, All right. They'll well, if it, if it pops into your head while we're going here, you yeah. can uh, jump in on it. Um, so, so your studio now it's a log cabin, and do you actually have like logs showing log not walls? Not actually studio part? in the studio. No. Okay. Um, this is a, and, and it's not a, uh, it's not like a uh, dusty old cabin from the twenties. You know, like it, it was born, or it was, it was. Erected in 1988, I think. Nice. Uh, so a year before I was born. One of the Lincoln log cabins. Right. <laughs> yeah. You see you driving on the highway. Um, but yeah, I, the studio is just in in the uh, the basement and slash garage that I kind of the the garage was was three stalls deep, um, and I took two of those stalls and kind of you know punched out a door to the basement, so it had its own separate entrance and. Um, Three of the walls, uh, like the if you're at the mix position, the the wall in front of you and the wall to your left and right are all fabric, and then the the ceiling is um, is just drywall, and then the the rear is drywall also. But and then the floors are hardwood. But that was an it was an interesting balance trying to like in a, a scary one trying to find the balance while you're building it to like. How is this going to sound? We right. So you did no a little idea. bit of build out to make it work. Yes, totally. Students. I mean, it, it was it literally was the the back two stalls of a garage. So I mean, it was so it, it was need, it needed walls. It needed everything. Yeah. So, so we we yeah. framed it out and um, framed it out and stuffed it with you know uh, insulation and then stretched fabric, stapled fabric to studs and and um, put the trim on and. Um, the the ceiling and the rear wall are not uh, symmetrical. You know, they kind of go down at right. angle, kind of like um, so kind of merge at the mixed position there. So they're you know trying to keep in mind to not have any 
any sort of. Uh, it's kind of like the compression ceiling design of the seventies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like Gibson. a Tom Hidley design, I think. Right. Yeah, I love those. Those pictures are always so cool. Looking. Yeah, that's what they had in Studio C over at Woodland Studios where I was interning. Oh yeah. And um, well, we've talked about that stuff a little bit on the podcast mm. too. Um. I think it was Michael Cronin, actually, who was a designer who was talking okay. about studying under Tom Hidley and oh, cool. and describing what that was. I would love to make it over to Woodland. I, I feel like I've been, I feel like I've been in the uh, reception area as an intern years yeah. ago. That that was my experience with Woodland. Yeah, well, that's where I interned, and and um, it was pretty fun. Uh, it's a different scene there now because it's privately owned, and right. they still do sessions, though. I think, yeah. Um, okay, so describe your mix setup. Like you're mixing. What, what do you use for monitors? Are you mixing in Pro Tools? Uh, I am. I'm. I'm all in the box. Um, I will if I am going to send uh, anything outboard. I will send it out and print it uh, so that there's you know nothing's uh, everything is recallable uh, instantly. Um, I just recently got into like this week got into a um dangerous d box just like a, a summing mixer um so i can't necessarily speak to the 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 qualities of it yet but i think it's going to be a a great thing and um looking to to add some some two bus chain stuff um, yeah we just had dr ford on the podcast um daniel ford and he was talking about using a lot of the dangerous audio stuff and yeah you know I guess some of them actually have parallel compression routing built into it and stuff like that. I don't know if the oh, D-Box uh, does. But. No, no. Um, yeah, this one's just an analog summing mixer, um, which i just been, I'd been mixing it a couple different places that have, you know, um, analog summing mixers. And I just thought that... Um, you liked the way it was sounding when you would mix there? Yeah, it just seemed like it, it, the the uh, dimensionality seemed to... to be better the the low end response seemed to be better um it's just yeah everything kind of took on like a sort of less clinical sounding uh sounding way which th that I liked like i said i've you know i've i've mixed maybe two songs through my right. know, setup right now well i mean so roswell really kid a, the record that kind of introduced us uh -huh. um precious art yeah Mixed all entirely in the box for you on that one? hundred percent. Yeah. And it sounds uh, great. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with, uh, to me to, to mixing in the box. There's, there's so many options, um, you know, which is, is good and bad, but, um, get good sounds going in. Uh, I feel like that's a lot of that record in particular was, I mean. Now is that one that you recorded as well or produced or anything like that? Yes. Uh, all of the above. Oh, nice. Uh, did everything but master that one. Let's talk that about one. it. Yeah. yeah, so mastering was Kim Rosen. Correct. Nice work, Kim. Um, yes, yes. She did a wonderful talk job. Talk about the band and, you know, how'd you get into Maybe tell us a little bit of the story of getting into that record and producing it. And doing yeah, it. those guys are from uh, West Virginia. Uh, I kind of, I guess I got introduced to them. Um, I was living in Nashville, but being a, a Pittsburgh guy, we kind of had some mutual friends uh, there in that, that scene and um, I think it ended up just being maybe I had done some mastering work for for a, a band of Jordan and Adams called the Demon Beat uh, earlier on, and uh, that kind of led to there being talks of of you know Jordan starting this new band called Roswell Kid, and uh, I remember he, they were in town playing one time with, with the the first band, and we were just talking about influences and kind of just seemed to be on the same page. Um, and at the time I, I was in a position where, you know, I was at a, a studio on music row. Uh, I, yeah, I guess I, would, I was interning at the time and kind of had the, the keys to the castle and the type of thing where it's like, Oh, I, we, we can, we can get in here at nights and weekends and we can, we can chip away at this thing. And so we did the first Roswell kid LP, um, or the one before Precious Art, a record called Too Shabby, we did in two weekends, I believe, like two two sittings, um, and you know, for for a, a 
grossly low amount of money, <laughs> you know. Um, but that was that was labor was, of love. Yeah, that's what was so exciting about it, it was, uh, you know, to me was being in that position where it's like I have access to this million dollar studio and I want to abuse it. <laughs> So what was the the studio that you had access to? The studio to? was Soundstage Studios on Music Okay, Pro. so was that where you were interning or something? Yep. Or where you were? That was the first place that I interned when I came, when I moved to Nashville. And um, I, I still work there quite a bit, um, tracking. I, I try to bring as many projects as I can over there. It's a wonderful studio. And um, Nick Autry, the studio manager, runs, runs a tight ship. And um, yeah, they, they've been so good to me uh, over the years. But, uh, you know, whenever, whenever I first got there, it was, that's all that I, I wanted to do. I was working a job at a radio shack, like 35 hours a week. And, uh, I would, I would take a look at my schedule on a weekly basis. So, okay, I'm working 35 hours at radio shack this week. I want to be at soundstage 36 hours and I would try to right. beat it every week. Right. Um, and, uh, nice. so a way that I could do that was, you know, like, at that time, there were a lot of late night sessions or a lot of hip hop sessions going on there, and that would only be using utilizing one room, and the other couple tracking rooms that are kind of on in the building um, were empty and were kind of ours for the taking. And a lot of the sessions they were very self sufficient, so we just literally, you know, like they would come in at nine o'clock at night and go till six a.m. So we just had to hang there all night and you know what better way to utilize your time than bring in your you know dipshit buddies rock yeah. and roll band <laughs> yeah totally well i mean I, I that's what i did too i mean like i was starting it at alex the great and um they would let me have access to go in there and you know do yeah. my do my own thing a little bit here a little bit there or or book it with the band i was producing mm -hmm. and um you know you got to start somewhere and i do think that that is the difference between the, you know, talking to somebody who's got a story to tell after having done this for a decade or two mm -hmm. um, and talking to somebody who, you know, who never really went anywhere with it is yeah. you got to have that self ambition to just pursue it, make it happen. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, love your story about like, you know, if you have to do the job and, but you want to be in the studio, just make sure that you're doing one hour a week more in the studio than the job. And then the job always feels like a side thing. Yeah. Just try to beat it. You know, uh, it was, um, I never felt like there was an option f for me, you know, like, and luckily, you know, like, luckily I, I, I had realized that whenever I was younger, but, um, you know, just. Yeah, me neither. I never considered any other kind of job or living being in Nashville. It was just make records. That's all I was going to do. Yeah. I, n I never really had another job. I delivered know? some pizzas until I wrecked my car doing a U-turn in an intersection. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> totaled it. Did anybody ever ask you as a pizza delivery man to run them errands? I, I'm just now learning that this is a thing that people like, Hey, could you stop and get me some paper towels too? You know, here's an extra 10 no. bucks for you. No, is that, you, what, oh, is, that, is that what people do now? Maybe it's just this one person that I was talking <laughs> to, but no. I thought that was really interesting. It was like, but I did have some, I did have some pretty cool. creepy moments. Like there was a, uh, a, um, a place called the Eleven Oaks Motel over mm -hmm. in um, Berry Hill, mm -hmm. which is around all the studios and around where I lived. Yeah, and uh, and I had, was called to deliver a pizza over there, and I went and opened the door, or you no, know, you knocked on the door, and then the door opens just a crack, and it's this like creepy old man in yeah. there, and he's like clearly not wearing any clothes. I don't yes. think, and and like what you see through the, and he's like. You know, he's like, "Oh, thank you so much, young man, for coming and bring like me a slip pizza." Through, you know, slip it through. Yeah, the crack and like what you door. see through the crack is that there's just like yellowed stacks of newspapers from the yes. bed cats all the everywhere. way to the ceiling. Yeah, probably cats <laughs> everywhere. And and I was just like, oh, "This is really weird." You know, yeah. I have to say at the same time, like the 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 uh, the creative side of me and the artistic adventurous side of me is like yeah. recognizes that as being totally creepy and weird, weird, right. but it doesn't it doesn't a hundred percent turn me off because like yeah. I see the value and like, Oh, this could be like really good for a Pulp Fiction novel sure, or like yeah. a song or something. Characters, man, you know, <laughs> Character like the value. I, I love, uh, nothing more than an, an artist or band full of characters. Yeah. You know? That's who, 
Yeah, I tended to gravitate towards artists that were like that too. I feel like that can be helpful if you want to do this, you know? Sure. Yeah, totally. And we've worked with a lot of crazy nutcases. Yeah. And typically those are the ones that let you kind of do whatever you want uh, yeah. sonically, you know, kind of create a. a and some bit of them of a go circus. on to be quite successful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, like then, then he paid for the pizza and like kind of like brushed the top of my hand. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, All right, get me out of here. That's probably why I like blew a U turn at high speed yeah. later, and then somebody smashed my car, and yeah. I was out. Get me out of here. I want to go back to the studio with norm where the normal people are. Yeah, and then well, I was done with that. Was in between interning and finally getting my act together and going knocking on studio doors. Yeah. So for six months, I didn't have a car, and then I was like. Just you got to get off the couch and stop drinking beer, you yeah. know, with your friends in your cheap apartment, right? And get out there and go find a real studio gig. So that yeah. led me to Alex the Great, and I got on the phone from that apartment. And gotcha. Got started. Um, all right, so dig it. Let's let's dig in a little bit more. So you're mixing in Pro Tools. What do you say your speakers and monitoring is in your studio? Uh, I have got a pair of PMC. Um, I think they're called Result or Result Sixes. It's the the newest. Um, small six inch woofer uh speaker from pmc and i i love them i've been on them for about six months and the imaging is spectacular and they're um relatively affordable uh you know the most affordable powered of their yeah and a dual cone kind of a system right or uh like no a tweeter and a driver yep just tweeter yeah. and driver uh and uh yeah i i also have like a little like kind of am radio uh it's a funny story how this kind of ended up. I, I had a friend of mine who wanted to record a song of his called Coast to Coast, and he was hoping to get it on Coast to Coast. Nice. And uh, so he wanted to, it was, I think, just like acoustic, vocal, and ukulele. And he wanted to send the mix o- over, <laughs> over the FM airwaves send it to a radio, mic it up and re-record it I've back. I've done that. And uh, so he got, he brought over this FM transmitter and this kind of like, uh, probably not high dollar one, but it's a pretty powerful one. Um, and so that's what we did. So we brought over this little like Telefunken uh, AM radio uh, with, you know, these RCA inputs. And so we ran his mix out to the FM transmitter, out through the airwaves, dialed it in back to the to the radio and remiked it, and I just kind of left that setup there, and uh, so now my second you know sort of set of speakers in there is is this radio, but n- not just going from the rig you know right to the radio, but going up through the airwaves. So you get in your car and go just dial in the radio to, to listen to a mix like that? I've never tried it, and I, I don't know how far the signal that I'm on is actually go. Like, if people on the road near me could dial in whatever it is I'm using <laughs> um, or not. But, but is it um, FM or AM, you said? It's FM. And it's a, a tube one? Uh, tube no. Mm-mm. Uh, no, it's just, just a solid state. But so how do you use it as an additional monitor? So I'm coming like just right out of my Pro Tools rig, like literally just a headphone out and going into this FM transmitter, which is, you know, transmitting it up and then down from the clouds back into uh, the FM radio, just like literally dialing it in. And what kind of FM airways. radio do you use that you like using? Uh, it's that? a Telefunken. I don't know what the model is. I mean, it's. Probably like a from, solid state, like a single speaker kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just a tiny little, like, prob maybe four inch speaker that's in there. I've never opened it up to see. Nice. But um, yeah, there's. I, I've thought about it. And I was like, I, I could. You could just go straight to the radio, and you know, it's just like the engineer in you is like, it's much cleaner. You don't have to go through the airwaves. What are you doing? Right. But I kind of just like the no, the idea of. Yeah. Of, doing it that way. Um, what sort of things, have you discovered anything when you've listened to your mix there where you're, where it was like, you're like, oh, that sounds like that. I should make a change. Yeah, totally. I mean, um, that's that's where you find out a lot about about where, where you're at and whatever phase of the mix you're at. You, you find out definitely what the loudest thing in your mix is. You, you find out, you know, if, if this part, you know, that, um, 
you, you know, the, the, the band or artist said, well, like, yeah, we're, we're not quite sure about that part. Maybe just turn it down in the mix and just kind of have it buried, which I hate when people say that. If it's, it's, <laughs> You're like, just don't use it then. Yeah, it's got to it's gotta do something. It's got to, you know, like it's got to move the needle or it's got to serve some kind of purpose or else get rid of it. Right. You know, there, there's no point to having something that, that is just taking up space, but you can't That's even like saying, let's, let's just unproduce that decision. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you, you find out, um, you know, especially where your bass and your vocal are, are sitting, uh, in, you know, if you kind of learn, you know, this little speaker setup, um, you can kind of make those decisions a little bit easier. I, I, I always try to, to listen, um, even on my main set of speakers, you know, when you're trying to make those critical decisions, listen as low as you can. Yeah, totally. You know, um, totally. That's going to tell you more than, you know, if you crank it up, it's just going to go right, right past you. Yeah, it's true. So, so we were recently talking about um, the sort of 85, 87 DBSPL sweet spot mm -hmm. with Dr. Ford about like a, a listening, a mixing and a listening level. Um, and I'm not sure if my SPL meter was quite working, but it was, mm -hmm. um, it's, it definitely feels loud to me. And I, and I think that as he pointed out, it's where the Fletcher Munson curve flattens out for our ears. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hear the highs and the lows, yeah. um, with equal weight to the, uh, the mids. And that was a C weighting SPL meter. Okay. But, um, but I agree when I'm actually just trying to listen and make balances. I like listening and mixing at a much quieter level. Sure. Um, and I, and I think it's also because I want to enhance just the mids. I want to make decisions about what's going on in the mids. Cause that is the most useful information in your mix. Sure. It's the most, it's the most insight you get into, you know, whether or not the balances are right between things and right. whether you'll be happy with it when you hear it out in the world in different locations. Exactly. When like it's, that. you know, playing from an iPhone speaker halfway across the room, you know, like what's going to, what's going to make the cut. You yeah. Know? Uh, Cause if you, cause you might have a big old bass, you might have other things. I mean, like it's sort of ironic that, you know, we, we live in an age of EDM bass music and pop production too. Yeah. And this one of the most important <laughs> yeah. instruments in that stuff, and you don't hear it at all on an iPhone, you know, right. it just doesn't even exist. Yeah. But that, uh, that shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't stop anybody from, from trying to make it, you know, just get no, those I'm lows. I'm dying to make it. I can't wait. <laughs> you know? I'm doing a little bit of it now. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then, of course, I've talked about it before, but, it, you know, you'll see behind you, I have the Avantone um, Cube, oh, yeah. which is a powered small speaker based okay, on that's the, just a the single Aura Tone. One, yeah, and I just one? got a single. Gotcha. So I just put it in, I, I just switched to the other speaker output yeah. and put it in mono so that it's feeding both the left and the right signals to it. Yeah, love it. I, I, I love that. Um, and and um, and it's it definitely helps a lot. It really helps me at a low volume just make some decisions about balance between the instruments, mm -hmm. sure. you know, make yeah. sure what, that what's taking precedent, uh, what, what's not. Love it. And uh, I just got a new car. Oh yeah. So I'm excited about learning, um, what my mixes sound like in there. And also sure, yeah. I'm, I'm really like, I'm hoping once again, that somehow I can drive the car down right next to the studio and set up something where I can like use my laptop and just make some balanced decisions in the car. Cause oh, that yeah. would just be, I think that would be exciting. Maybe it would actually suck. Maybe I would like take all the magic out of just, you know, yeah. my but car being a place where I just get to enjoy music. Supposedly. I, so I hear that was a Vance Powell and raconteurs thing was they would do, you know, the FM transmitter thing oh, yeah. and they would tweak out in the parking lot out in the van or, you know, there out you in somebody's go. car and they would, they would be on, you know, either a cell phone or, you know, like a walkie talkie up, or something, you down. know, yeah, yeah. Base down. Oh, yeah. Walkie talkie oh. would be good. Cause then, you know, you're not, it's not distracting you while the music's happening. You just turn right. it on or turn it off. Exactly. So it's like, I, I, I thought that was uh that was a very interesting uh, notion. And it's like, at the end of the day, if it, if it makes you, if it makes you think that it sounds better, then it sounds better. Yeah, well, there's there's so many clever ways to try and do that stuff now. So, for example, you know, my studio computer is sort of, it's not mobile. It's tied into the studio mm -hmm. and, you know, connected to the studio monitors. 
but the Wi-Fi signal reaches right out in mm-hmm. the parking lot. So I could yeah. um, I could pull my car right up to the edge of the studio and get Wi-Fi there. And and then my phone would plug into the car stereo. So theoretically, if I can get some sort of, you know, use um, like Airfoil or one of these kind of apps with um, audio hijack, I think I might be able to get the, yeah. the audio signal going from the studio, you know, right out the door to the car. But right. we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Maybe there's another, maybe I can do like some sort of long Ethernet cable. That'd be a good way. Ooh, maybe I could do a long Ethernet cable over an AVB from oh, yeah. the studio out to the car. There you go. That'd be something. And then, because then you can do the the laptop will do the remote control, no problem. Right. All right, rock stars. I'm getting real geeky here, but <laughs> you know, it's exciting. If you if this is something that's on your mind, this is the kind of stuff that's pretty exciting. Hey, uh, we're going to take a break now. We'll be right back for the jam session. A reminder that we're going to include links to stuff we're talking about in the show notes. I've got a um, a playlist there, so you can go see some videos and listen to Justin's awesome work. Check it out. And uh, of course, a link over to his studio as well. So you can go see what his log cabin studio is all about. We'll see you in just a minute for the jam session. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave Pinsel and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish there was an easy solution right now? Quisproom Isobooths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated isobooth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Quisproom has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with isobooths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more or at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Justin Francis joining us here at the Toy Box Studio. We're going to dig into 
talking about mixing. Go deep on mixing. You ready to jam, dude? I'm ready to jam. You ready to mix? I'm ready. Well, I don't know about that, but I'm ready to jam. So we were just talking about subs for a sec. We might as well keep talking about that for a sec because you mentioned your um, PMC results, six inch speakers. Um, but, and then I was asking you if you have a sub and you said, no, no, I don't. They don't, you know, they don't have tons of low end, but you also don't have a sub yet. Um, and, you know, part of the comment we were saying is that like, you know, you know, well, I'll just ask you now. I mean, do you think you're going to get a sub or you're just on the fence about it still? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I've never, I've never, I never really liked tracking with a sub or the, the few times I've tried to incorporate a, a sub into, into mixing. It just, it was always just felt like more of an obstacle that I had to, um, like another uncertainty. Yeah. That I, that I had to get around or, or learn, you know, you know, what, what was going on, um, or something that I had to battle. Uh, yeah, I think a sub that's not really carefully included. Mm -hmm can just add confusion for sure, you know? Sure. Yeah. And I mean, I, in theory, I, you know, uh, everything's going to go through a, a great mastering engineer, you know, who's going to sort out your, your sub sub mess. Um, so what, what does that mean for you when you go and you're doing your mixing, how much attention do you pay to things below 70, 60, 50 Hertz? Oh, I, I mean, I, I, try to pay attention a lot to, um, to, to everything down there. And, and I'm careful to, to, uh, high pass, you know, I try to high pass everything, um, you know, to, to clear as much room out uh, on the bottom and leave room for, for what needs to be down there. Um, but, uh, um, what, what does need to be down there? I mean, your, your, your bass instruments, your, your kick drums, your lower, lower end of your guitars, your, um, you know, but really like in a, in a modern production, that's about it, Yeah, you know? Um, and so what's a good way for, um, you know, anybody in a home studio with small speakers mm -hmm. to get a sense of how to make some smart decisions in those zones? Um, I would say maybe, or, or, or make any decision at all. You yeah. Know? I, I would say maybe get to get a, um, some kind of uh, frequency spectrum analyzer, uh, be it a, a plug-in or a hardware, um, and run some of your favorite stuff through it, and just get to know the the patterns and shapes, and like, oh, well, normally it kind of slopes downhill like this as the frequencies get higher, or like in these favorite records of mine where I love how the low end sound, maybe it's not quite as low as you think. Right. Right. That's always a real eye opener. You're like, Oh shit, this yeah. is like, this is not that much. Yeah. Or, or this is, you know, like this is really where the power is coming from is, is this, um, and you, you may be surprised. So just, just getting to know, um, that visually, if, if you're not in a place, um, uh, where you feel like you can hear that or, you know, just whatever the circumstances are, um, you know, uh, you get to know what it looks like anyways. So what's a good way to do that? How do, how would you do that in your studio? How would you actually take a favorite record and mm -hmm. play it through a frequency spectrum analyzer? Um, I, I mean, at my place, I would just, I would imp just import it into pro tool, into a pro tool session on a new track, or honestly, I'll do that with, um, a lot of mixes now and, and I'll compare them to kind of current mixes, um, that are happening. Maybe the artist's last record or maybe, um, something that, you know, they kind of wanted to be in the ballpark of, uh, you, you kind of AB, um, you know, I'm constantly referencing, uh, other people's work and other people's mixes, um, that, uh, you know, and, and just try to just compare. It, it's not that one's going to be, you're not looking for a decision of whether one is better than the other one. You're just looking for red flags or you're looking for, you know, like, oh, wow, I I never thought about that before, but there is so much space around this vocal, you know, that isn't, doesn't really seem to be there in mine. So maybe, you know, maybe I need to carve out some of the upper mid range from from the overheads or something that's kind of just all up in that, that vocal range. Um, but yeah, I mean, c uh, referencing stuff is, is, uh, very, very important. At least when I'm working. 
Yeah. So what's a good way that you find to reference stuff? Is there like a, do you use a, a referencing kind of plugin or do you just use a switch on your, no, I'll, your, I'll just, uh, I mean, I'll AB, um, I'll just AB stuff uh, straight up, you know, going from, from my mix to, um, kind of the, the way that I'm working is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going out to this analog summing, uh, box and then coming back in and, and I'm literally printing back into, into pro tools. Um, and so, you know, that's on record or that's on input, but maybe I'll put underneath it what it's sort of printing over. I'll put the reference. And so you just flip in and out of input. And when you're out of input, you're, you're back to, you know, whatever song you're referencing. Uh, and when you're in input, your and I'll line courses up or you know something like that. It's like oh, okay, well here's the high point in this production or or whatever. Um, That's a clever way to do it. And when I flip out of input, it's just a fast way to do it that doesn't have like a big uh, volume discrepancy or like a, a jogging click or anything right, right. weird. Or Isotopes um, Ozone has that great match EQ thing that right. uh, you know I, I don't use all the time, but it's interesting to um it's interesting to see where it's like wow this i love the way this record sounds and there's a steep steep roll off at you know 14k or something you know it's there's nothing up there um it's it's interesting to to see that stuff in in front of you and and kind of like but yeah now now that you uh now that you can see it in front of you 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 never you never noticed it before yeah, that's good advice. Uh, referencing comes up a lot in the podcast, and it's just it needs to. It's always this thing. Sure, yeah. You know, we need to be reminded over and over. Yeah. Keep checking yourself. Keep yeah, checking. Check, check your mixes on, on you know, I always have uh, a pair of Fostec T20s uh, beside me just because. Those are the headphones, old school headphone, headphones. Yeah, right? headphones. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of times I'll get my my first working balance on those. Um just because I feel like nothing's going to go past me on them. Um, I've done I've done stuff like that too. Um, I was just listening to a record recently that I really loved how it turned out, and I remember that I was doing. I started the mixes, you know, being given like half an hour to mix each song for rough mixes mm. for the band while they were here, and so I popped headphones on, um, and and did it that way, and I didn't. That wasn't the final mix. I still had to rebalance in the speakers because you get a different energy level. Yeah. But that was the first time I noticed. I was like, man, with headphones, you can just hear everything. You can hear exactly where you're setting a gate. Right. You can hear exactly what the reverb's doing. Yeah. I mean, so it, much it, easier to hear the details, especially yeah. when there's noisy people in the studio, you know? Oh, yeah, which there always is. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, tell us what a mix template looks like to you. Is, that, is there anything about your mix workflow that you find like you, you always want to repeat certain things as a starting place. Um, yeah, I, I do have, I do have templates that I work from, um, you know, and, and stuff that I'll pull, you know, typically stuff that I'll pull into every mix is kind of my, uh, mix bus type situation, um, where I'll have a dedicated kind of ox master for, the track, I'll have a dedicated aux master for any vocal stuff, and then I'll have a dedicated aux master for effects stuff. Uh, and then those three stereo pairs are being sent out to the summing mixer and then and then printed back in. I um, see. So those might be also printable stems if you need to make stems. Right, or and, like and it's also um, it's also a, a great convenience to be able to mute the track and the vocal, and just you're just hearing your wet. Uh, you know everything that's that's supposed to be super wide, um, super airy. You can you can hear that at the click of a button, which I never really had before, which is really interesting. Yeah, that's a good reminder. I don't think I do that enough. Um, but yeah, rather than trying to solo the effects, you just simply mute the returns of the other guys. Yeah, or or trying to flip stuff over into a pre fader send, and, and the, but then the level changes, and you, right. you know, it's just totally. this is a, a super easy way to do that. Um, so that uh, I'll typically pull into every mix, and I started doing that when I was mixing this record, and they just couldn't get the vocal loud enough. Uh, well, I guess I couldn't get the vocal loud enough for them. Um, 
and it it seemed you know it seemed sort of well beyond where where I thought it should be, and um, I, I was reaching a point where you know like I I don't know how I could how I can turn this vocal up anymore without, you know, like it's hitting the ceiling. It's obviously the loudest thing. Um, so I needed to take it out of the main mix, but, you know, the mix bus compression was, was pulling it down. Cause it was the first thing that it was that the mix bus compressor compressor was seeing. So if you separate it out now I can hit the, the instrumental as hard or as soft as I want to hit that. And I can hit the vocals. You can kind of treat them separately, right? So rather than one stereo compressor that's compressing everything and fighting for mm -hmm. attention, right. you can treat the vocals just so. You can treat all the instruments just so, right? And that seemed to be able that to achieve a sense of of um, kind of separation from that. You know, like because the particular project it needed to be like a like superstar level. Uh, you know, Mariah Carey level uh, vocal. And um, I think we were able to to achieve that um, working that way. And, and it kind of has stuck with me uh, since. So most, more often than not, that will be the setup was uh, we'll, I'll, I'll split them and treat them differently. So something else about vocals, again, Roswell Kid, I keep mentioning that because mm -hmm. I just really like that, yeah. that record that you did. Yeah. Um, they have really cool vocals. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about doing vocals with those guys? What were things you learned? How'd you record them? How'd you mix it? Well, um, jo Jordan is is one of the funnest people to be around and, and to work with in a studio. Uh, just the the level of energy is is unbelievable. And I remember going home and my abs hurting, being sore from laughing so hard. He. And I noticed, or, or I realized, at, you know, after we had done, you know, the second record, that like, this is he's not he's not trying to be funny and make us laugh. This is his process where, to where, you know, obviously, I guess nobody's heard this stuff uh, besides us. But in between verses during instrumental sections, um, he would he would just make all kinds of wild noises and just rev himself up, act like, you know, like a, like a, um, like a car is revving up and coming around the corner and, and, but then he'll stop right when he's supposed to enter back into the last chorus. And when you take all of that, you know, trash away, the level of energy remains because he has just psyched himself yeah, up yeah. so hard yeah. And I think that that level of of enthusiasm and and energy comes through um, in in all of his vocals. And he he always has such a great um, idea of of what he wants. He kind of already has it all up up in his head, you know. Yeah, that, it didn't sound like this was writing in the studio music. Yeah, um, it sounded like it was well prepared. Um, what about vocal mic choice? Was this like a, a singer who? The SM7 was the perfect choice for, or 57, or is this somebody who was great on a condenser mic? Hmm, let's see. We we did um, those records. We we always did live, except for vocals. So the band was tracking live, and on the floor he would have an SM7 while he was playing guitar. And um, to be honest, I forget. I, I feel like we always put him on a tube condenser when when we ended up doing vocals. Right. Um, probably would have been like an ADK 67 copy um, uh, or possibly it could have been like a Sound Deluxe 251 that we did it on. Um, it's got that nice, nice snarky mid-range. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that is really needed when you go to a condenser mm -hmm. for pop and rock, isn't it? It's like that's um, the mids, the way that mids cut through mm -hmm. tends to be one of the reasons why an SM7 can be a good choice, right. I find, you know? Yeah. It's like sometimes I'll go for the big one. I'm like, oh, that sounds so great. But as soon as you blend it into the track, you're like, where'd the vocal go? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It just gets, yeah, lost in with all the other, all the other sizzle. Um, and and Devin, uh, the the bass player in Roswell Kid is, is a great, singer also so he did a lot of harmony uh of the harmony Is it two work. voices on the, that record mostly um or did you guys get into layering and stuff like that i believe we probably i probably created doubles on jordan's lead vocal just from alternate passes 
um, on choruses, you know, like I would probably stack those up just, just from another pass, um, bring chorus two to chorus one and whatever. All, like most of that stuff was on a click. So I was able to do that. Um, yeah. and then I think it was probably myself and Devin that did most of the harmony stuff on those. Um, and that would be the type of thing where myself, that would be, I would just put that on the back burner and I'll do that when y'all leave, you know, while I'm mixing. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, we didn't used to always be able to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a long time we have been able to do it, but it's also um, can be a really good choice sometimes. The idea of like, does somebody actually need to sing something that's quote a double track now? Right. Or do you just take something that you've already got yeah. and build a double out of it? Yeah. Well, you know, do you ever notice people sing differently when they're when they're hearing another version of yeah. themselves and they're yeah. trying to match it? In, in some people, um, some people are the type where they're never going to sing it the same way. It's pretty hard. I've I've done doubling on my own stuff, and it takes a lot of bits mm -hmm. and pieces at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah a lot of and then sometimes slivers. you're just like, oh, fuck it, you know, yeah. it's good. It's gonna have to. Right. That's good enough. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Jordan is one that, that can double himself really well. And, and there was, you know, a, a lot of instances on that record where, you know, I definitely want to double or I definitely want to triple. And, um, that band in those records are records of excess. You know, if, if the idea was to do one pick slide, then 27 pick slide tracks is going to be, Sweet. You know, it's going to be much better. Um, so, you know, there, there were times where he, he would want to stack and stack and stack and stack and stack. Um, there was one track on. That sounds like a good name for a record, like 20, just in big, bold letters, yeah. 27 pick slide. 20, <laughs> we are 27 not even, pick slides. Not even slides, just 27 pick slide. It sounds like, some, right. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, love it. Um, um, very cool. Uh, let's see what else I want to ask about. So uh, maybe just to to carry on with the doubling idea, when you are engineering and doubling, are there any ways where you found it helpful to make it easier for the singer to who's who doesn't already know how to perfectly double their track to do it well? Um, if they don't, if it doesn't come super naturally, I tend to not pursue it. Um, yeah, just see if you can build it later. Right. Uh, it, it. You know, like I'm, I'm kind of all about just mo moving things forward and, and not not getting too stagnant or, or not getting hung up on trying to make quick decisions and trying to, you know, like, sure, if you, you want to try to double it, let's do it. If it's, if it doesn't happen in, you know, three, five takes of a course, and I can foresee that. This if it is doesn't a, happen by the end of my sentence, then you suck and we're moving yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> right. If, if you can see that this isn't, isn't going to happen, then, you know, it's not meant to be. And it's, it's probably not, even if you do get it to happen, it's probably not going to sound very natural. Right. You might not actually want it later. It might be the first thing that you mute. Right. And if you remember how hard you worked on it, it makes it that much harder to mute it later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we got to <laughs> so, use this. So that's maybe that is some good advice is like, what are some ways we can forget all about how hard we worked on stuff so we can be much more, mm -hmm. you know, much bolder with a machete and just go in and just. Right edit and destroy and get rid of all the crap yeah. that we record in the Wouldn't studio. Wouldn't it be great if we could, yeah, just like at the end of a record, before mix, you can hit a button and kind of wipe your memory clean. Yeah, like, of, like uh, Men of, in Black, just have them visit the yeah, studio. Yeah, one of those little flashy, our minds. flashy pen things. Um, yeah, and and you, you forgot all about it. It's like, well, this guitar solo took, uh, you know, it took an hour to set up all these room mugs and all this and that, so we have to use it. Um or, you know, you go into it clean and like, well, just let your ear. Yeah, that would be great. You start mixing your own music clean and you're like, what the fuck? A hundred kick tracks. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need that. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, Roswell Kid and a bunch of your records mm -hmm. have really punchy drums. Mm. That's one of the things I noticed about it. How do you get them to cut through so well and have plenty of natural body to the shell on those rock stuff where you've got the... You know, it's pretty full with the guitars and stuff, but still that drum shell is just coming through nicely. Sure. Um, and I, I feel What's like your fucking secret, man? A good, I feel like a good sounding uh, drum set will go a long way. And, and somebody that knows how to hit them, it all starts with the player and with... Uh, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about um, you've got a good, good sounding drum kit. You've got a good drummer. Yeah. Um, how do you... What, what are some typical ways you might mic up the drums? What do you, how do you handle it? Um, 
it's all it's all circumstantial for for those types of uh records like the, the Roswell kid the diary of planets uh we cut those in big wood rooms so that they have a naturally great sounding wood walls as well or? uh yeah wood walls wood floor very very high ceiling um just a great uh a great length of decay to the room just a nice natural sound um you know, I don't know. Maybe on those records, maybe we took fourteen channels. You, you know, uh, typically I'm a kick in, kick out, snare top, snare bottom, hat tom one, tom two, stereo overhead, stereo room, maybe a a crotch mic or a trash. What does mic. A stereo overhead look like to you usually? I mean, there's there's it's easy to stay stereo overhead. It's mm. it's um, but then you realize you're like, wait, where do I put these two mics? Right. Uh. Well, it, it depends on the kit. You know, um, you know that it, it takes uh, it takes a little bit of discipline to to put mics where they don't look like they should go. You know, um, one technique being like the Glenn Johns thing. You look at that, you're like, what? It's never gonna work. You you're know, like, what that guy's famous for this? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it, it's like, uh, it, but when it does work, it it works. You know. It works wonderfully. Um, so uh, stereo, I mean, just depending on the, the layout of the kit, if, if he's got seven toms over on this side and he has three snares over on this side, your stereo overheads are going to look different than, it's if, than if it's just a kick snare, one up and one down. That's going to be a pretty tight, uh, you know, overhead configuration. Um, so uh, again, so it's, it's, it's almost like if you're looking at the kit and the kit is a wide kit, it becomes more of a spaced pair. Right. And, and you're kind of just getting sections of the kit, you know, because it, it depends what what you want to capture in those overheads. So, sometimes I go into it thinking like these are cymbal mics. Sometimes I th- I go into it thinking these are going to be my main drum sound and I'll, right, I'll right. put them you know, maybe shoulder height behind the drummer, just mimicking his ears. That's a pretty cool way to down. do it as long as they don't hit it. And as long right. as the click track isn't screaming loud in their headphones. Right, right. right. I've yeah. had that happen before. Get them some, uh, some of those gun muffs and some gaff tape and just yeah. <laughs> work, work it around. Just, or just cut his head off. <laughs> you didn't need it. Uh, but yeah, stereo overheads. It's, it's supposed um, to be playing with his heart anyway, right? Right, Exactly. Um, okay, cool. So, so getting the, you know, stereo over, overheads, what about room mics? What do you find, uh, that you do when recording drums where later when you go mix it, you're like, fuck yeah, I'm glad we got those. You, you, you asked me if we swear on the podcast. Now I've sworn like three times yeah. in the past, you know, five minutes. So I want to save mine. Really, really like I don't raising. know if I have so far, but it could be because I'll I just finished it. a cup of espresso here and it's like almost 6 PM. That'll do it. Yeah. I'll be up tonight. Um, <laughs> but, um, so you're recording some ambient or drum room mics mm-hmm. and later you're mixing it and you're like, yes. Yeah. So glad I got these versus like you're trying to use them and you're like, I, I, yeah, I have to use this because I recorded it, but where does it go? Right. Um, yeah. I mean, typically, you know, like everything, I, I try to not let anything go past the, the tracking stage that is not useful, you know? Uh, so just while it's there, while you while you have them pulled up, if 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 you feel like it's not working, then change it right then and there. And and you know, some well, of let me ask you this: What are some things that cue you as to whether it's working or not working? Let's say you've got all your close mics up, you got a drum kit that sounds you know mm-hmm. close mics are sounding good. Yeah. Um, do you typically have some? room mics that are kind of far? Do you have something that's closer that you call an ambient or anything like that? What are, Mm -hmm. what are some other mics choices that you might explore? Um, let's see. I I love a a Coles 4038. I typically, those would be my go-to, you know, uh, drum room mic, uh, they're figure of eight patterns. So they're, they can get nice and ambient. Um, but they don't get too splashy, uh, being a ribbon mic. They're, they're pretty hefty, uh, Sounding. You do like a pair of those sort I'll of spaced do, out or something like that? Maybe? I'll do a pair of them and, uh, yeah, typically spaced out, um, maybe depending on the size of the room, maybe six feet apart. And depending on how splashy or bright the drum set is, I'll either have them pointed directly at the kit or if I feel like the kit's a little too splashy, I'll point them down so they're 
they're not so it's getting more direct. up and down and they're they're rejecting the direct kit but getting picking up the room everywhere. right and you know like if 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 the drummer happens to be pretty heavy uh heavy handed on the brass you know like kind of put them right at cymbal level and turn them down so kind of the yeah, null that's clever the null of of you know just think of wherever you would put cymbal mics put them right there but then turn them so the null is facing that. So that that takes me to the another question I wrote down, mm-hmm. which is on the slamming records like Talk Shit and White Wives, Yeah, how do you handle wild hi-hats and cymbals to make sure they work in your mix? Is this is this part of that secret? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, just just um, a, a lot of times, and a lot of times with, with band-type stuff, um, maybe they are a little heavy on the brass, or maybe their cymbals aren't aren't the nicest uh, of the nice. So there's there's a couple little tricks to kind of um, like that room mic thing to, to try to keep some of those out. Um, another one is is try to, if if you get into a bind where you feel like it's too splashy, there's too much stuff in it, cr- just create a, uh, create your own room track. Ditch your room mics and send your, your dry drums, your kick snare and your toms to a, uh, to a super tight verb ox and, you know, compress that and try to make it sound like a drum room. And then, um, there you go. And now you got one with no, no symbols in it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, yeah, and unless just, your hi hat's screaming through the snare mic, right? Right. Any yeah. tricks for that? Um, that's, I, I used to, um, I used to do a, a couple things where, uh, I saw a guy who had a ping pong paddle the, the handle on a typical ping pong paddle is about the size of a 57. So like one of those sure 57 clips, it fits right into. So they would get another mic stand and put it with the ping pong paddle right there above the snare Ooh, that's drum That's a clever mic. idea. Would they treat the ping pong paddle or would it just have the soft rubbery stuff oh, on it? Maybe? Just the soft. Well, actually. Not the cheap hard one with sandpaper on it like right. I always get stuck with. <laughs> I think he would put it in a um, like a Crown Royal bag. You know, like the purple ah, uh, yeah. bag, and, yeah, and then and put that on the on it, the clip. That and, raises the question. So, Crown Royal bags seem to make um, yeah. <laughs> an appearance in the audio world as very, very useful tools. Um, one of the first places I saw it was on the other end for the breakout of the XLRs on a on a mic snake when it was coming and going from a, a live gig the engineer would always take all the ends and like put it in a crown royal bag and, right. and close it up and take it. And yeah. then there's another That's example. I wonder, I wonder what other industries the crown royal bag has turned out Plays to be the perfect in. solution, um, you know? I don't know. I mean, it, it, they're just great little, great little bags, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I'm sure they're useful for all kinds, obviously microphone storage. If you keep your mics on stands, uh, you know, just putting a little, putting a little hood on them every night. If you don't have, uh, you know, if your mic didn't come with one or uh, somebody ran yeah, yeah, off that's with a, yours. That's a good tip. Yeah. In fact, I was just talking to Chad Brown about that. And he was like, yeah, when you're at night, you, leaving your mics on the stands in the studio, that's great. But mm-hmm. at night, I mean, we all know there's a lot of dust in there. Sure. Just yeah. put a bunch of Crown Royal bags. Cover them up. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm prepared to drink that much Crown Royal to get there, but yeah. um, just covering all the mics in the studio in between sessions is a, is a cool idea. Mm-hmm. Also, it might be really useful even just putting them away, you know, like um, if you're just putting them in drawers or something like that, keep them from banging on each other. Right. See, I, I came up through um, through that place, Soundstage Studios, some Music Row studio uh, here in Nashville, and it was every night the floor had to be wiped clean, 100%. Yeah. And, and, it, and then the studio had to be cleaned. You know, so so while I was an intern, not only were we taking, you know, and, and these were big sessions too, you know, you had drum space, two electrics, acoustic, steel, piano, P3, keys, uh, a vocal, maybe a fiddle. So you've got maybe, I don't know, 35, 40 channels worth of, of stuff. And at the end of the night at, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night, everything has to come up. So like, I've... I've just gotten into the habit now of, of kind of just wiping, uh, at least in my mix room, if I have, I try to not leave a, a big old mess. If I go down a wormhole with some pedals or, or try miking something, I'm always 
tidying it all up just because yeah. that's how I, I've been trained to to be. Yeah, me too. And I mean, I always call that like um, setting the the studio, calling it a blank slate. Like every time mm-hmm. the new session comes in, it's a blank slate for whatever that session needs. Yeah, it's, you know? it's also a great, yeah, it's, it's a great way. It's probably what you were thinking was a great way to not just like, well, this was what was on it last night. Let's just roll. Let's just yeah. roll with that. It's like, no, let's craft a sound for this thing it doesn't need to be you know it doesn't need to be the super punchy kick drum that like we had last night it this needs to be super open and it doesn't yeah deserve, let the it instrument doesn't warrant, tell you where to go with this first maybe in the song yeah it doesn't warrant yeah it doesn't warrant the same thing that was there last night so I, it's it's hard to not um it's hard to not be lazy sometimes but yeah but it know. does teach you to um set up and tear down quickly mm-hmm. for sessions um and uh, we might as well talk about that for just a sec. But a couple of things I've learned about that is when you're setting up for sessions, uh, the more you make that microphone and that stand permanent, mm-hmm. the more likely you're going to have to move it right away. Right. So don't make anything <laughs> yeah. permanent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It looks neat and it looks impressive to try and impress everybody else with, you mm-hmm. know, taking some nice gaff tape and gaff taping the right. mic cables down to the floor. But don't do that because will move. they will yeah. have to move and then it's going to be a real hassle. A nightmare. Don't yeah. put the rug, don't put the extra rug over the mic cables that are yeah, running with across the With a drum the set floor. on top of it. Yeah. But now you have to chase down that cable when it's going <laughs> underneath exactly. the rug in a drum set. Exactly. And then at teardown is like, man, be quick. You know, it's like you, you want to be kind and careful with all the gear. Sure. But mic cables are designed for you to move quickly, you know, learn how to right. coil them very quickly. Mm-hmm. Another pet peeve is um, coil it and then, you know, do tie the single knot around the coil. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess if you have the the Velcro connectors or something, that's fine. Right. But, you know, most of the time you don't have Velcro connectors. You just do a very, very yeah. gentle single knot. Right. You're not trying to, like, put kinks in the cable. Yeah. But when people just coil up the cables and they and they think they've neatened up and then they just make a pile and you right. go pick it up and it's like now all of a sudden they yeah. all just tangle Spaghetti. into a big mask and yeah. mess and you're like oh good lord yeah it's the worst um, yeah but yeah tear 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 down it leads to uh, leads to more creative decisions tomorrow yeah now I will also counter that by saying other guests like John Fields on the podcast mm-hmm. um, and probably some others have talked about the benefit of having all your instruments mic'd up so you never, ever have to wait to do a sound. Totally. that's. Um, and for me, I find the balance has been, um, I don't have the space to keep a drum kit mic'd up all the time. Chad Brown, for example, his studio is, mm-hmm. is great like that. It's like, there's always a mic, a drum drum kit that's mic'd up, right. you know? So you can go quickly, but but you're right. You do It does guide you towards a similarity in sounds yeah. But the benefit would be that you can compose music very quickly because you don't have to. Sure. You don't. You know. You don't have to wait for the engineering. Um, and for me, the balance has been tear the big things down, but always leave mics a couple of mics that are right there, so it's super to fast go. to grab a mic and go. Grab and go on you know single mic overdubs and stuff. Totally. I, I've been um, working on these sessions lately that, that have, we've had the luxury to have a little bit more time and a little bit, um, a little bit more free freedom uh, in the day where it's not kind of slam and go. And it's just like, yeah, we're going to see how it goes. We're going to try. Yeah. The goal is to maybe do these electric guitar overdubs, but we might get into doing some perk stuff. We might get into doing some background stuff. So, you know, the night before just make sure everything is, is going to be there at your disposal when you want to. Yeah, grab yeah. We used quickly. to call it the rover mic. Right. Yeah. You just set up one extra mic, which doesn't have an assignment yet, but it's yeah. there to rove around. Yep. Or yeah. on the drum kit, we'd have a rover mic too, because you're like, we might just want one that we put close to the hi hat or put close to the rod for the song or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, so let's jump back into mixing because we did promise we we're gonna yeah, yeah. do a lot of mixing stuff. So sure. um, give us some cool things that you like to do in the box as far as mixing drums. Where are some useful tricks for, um, you know, they can be very basic if you want right yeah. through advanced anything or anything that's just on your mind. Sure. Yeah. With some, um, with some cool stuff to do when yeah, mixing you, drums. you were talking about kind of punch and, and making sure everything was, was cutting through, um, as far as the, the dry drums, uh, typically I always, you know, on an upbeat tune have some kind of parallel kick and snare, uh, dedicated, 
uh, compression scheme. Now, like two dedicated compressors, one for kick, one for snare, or one for both kick and snare? One for each. Uh, And typically it's like, you know, some kind of 1176 all buttons in type thing where it's just, it's leveling it pretty good. Um, Uh, Otherwise known as cray cray. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And would this be a plug-in? Uh, We're in the box at this point? Typically, Or might you route out through something? No, yeah. Sometimes I'll track with, you know, what is sort of the equivalent to to what I end up doing mix-wise is I'll I'll run a malt of the kick in and the snare top to a pair of those um, standard audio level ores. Familiar with those? Um, They're kind of the sure level lock. Not super familiar, but they're um, just the name. Um, It's basically just like a- A little bit like a level lock or a a stay level or something like that. Yeah, it's it's basically just like a little distortion box. Um, But, you know, it will flatline- anything that goes through it and just having something that's steady, um, steady power, uh, in the kick and snare drum pattern, um, that you blend in with the, the natural dynamics of the quote unquote dry mics, uh, just kind of lends some solidity to, uh, the overall kit sound. And and it's not like you're, you know, on their own. Sure. They sound, you know, Totally squashed, yeah. Yeah, or yeah, it's like this would we would never use this, but you put them in and they're maybe 20% of your sound, then you have a nice solid foundation that you get that that gives your dry mics kind of room to to go up and down and fluctuate in volume and to kind of um not be super squash sounding. But the squash mics might not also go up and down, they might actually stay in one level. Um yeah, well the you mean the the parallels? Yeah, when you're talking about them going up and down, are you talking about actually mixed decisions where you're like, no, just like performance-wise, the you right, know the the right. natural dynamic of the drummer, right. uh, you know, is hitting harder in the third chorus than he was in the second chorus, and you you want that to come through, so you don't want to smash your 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 regular kick and snares to oblivion so that the third chorus sounds like the intro. How about halfway to oblivion? Can I you know, smash yeah. it halfway to oblivion? We are halfway to oblivion. <laughs> is, there, there, is there like a classic B movie called halfway to oblivion? Cause I'm I feel sure. like there should be. I'm sure. Um, so yeah, yeah, that always typically on kick and snare for anything that's, that's rocking um, in drum room. I'm a big drum room mic guy. Um, love, Distortion boxes on on drum room mics. Um, love the the transient designers um, from SPL. Those two. Wonderful now, why things. do you like that for the drum room mics? Which which way do you turn your knobs? There's not that many to turn on a transient. Yeah, designer. there's there's just an attack and sustain, and typically sustain at about two o'clock gets you into a. So you're adding some sustain. Correct. Yeah, right. and just trying to milk the room for everything. Yeah, it's almost it's like you're pulling the length out of the drum shells, right? Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's literally adding adding sustain to to whatever it is that you're putting through it. Um, rolling back some of the attack on on your room mics, so those aren't so punchy. So those are a little bit more round, and then that will leave room for your your dry. Uh, Right, you want to you want to extend the length of your drums. That's that's usually part of what we're instinctively missing when these drums don't rock enough or something. They're they're loud enough, but they don't rock enough. Right, right? it's like we're just not hearing. Yeah, they don't last as long. Yeah, they don't last as long. Right, and then you've already solved. Assuming you did your nice figure eight trick, you've already solved the problem of yeah. But when I accentuate these room mics, all I'm getting is cymbal and brightness. Right. Yeah. And you, you have to keep that in mind too, while, while you're going down, while, while you're tracking, it's like, well, these, these mics are probably going to be distorted or, or, um, you know, compressed significantly more, uh, during mix. So let's maybe have it, uh, to where you just do a quick AB and like, here's what it's going to sound if it's going to be smashed right, right. So later. So that's you know? what the, the question that sparks for me is, you know, do you get frustrated by the fact that when you're working in the DAW so much and you're, and you're going to use plugins for mixing that at the point of tracking, you're like, I can't put the plugin on to see what it's going to sound like very easily. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have to imagine what it's going to sound like. I know that pisses me off sometimes, you know? Yeah. Cause in rock stars to explain why is because, each either either you know 
Pro Tools may or may not let you see the plugin. I guess it depends on which version you're using. You may right, it may not leave the plugin active while you're recording until they you give play you latency back. Or yeah, but it, it introduces latency, so now you've got a phase shift. Yeah. But um, and I'll I'll just keep going if you don't mind. Okay. So so my thought was, which I think is what you, maybe you're suggesting is. You just record a little bit of that. Hold on, guys. Let's check this. Rewind. Now you play back. Now you can go crazy with the EQ with whatever plugins and sort of spot check it. Oh, cool. That's going to work great. Right. And then you don't have to worry about it so much in the tracking stage. Yeah. Typically, you don't. More often than not, you don't have time to do that, or you don't want to um, inconvenience uh, the players by while you get your shit together. Uh, right, right. You know, but you know, like even while while you're getting sounds, you know, like if you have a a compressor in the chain, see what it see what it does if you go ape shit with it, uh, and see how far you can take it. And like, well, this gets super gnarly, but I I hate with the I hate all these symbols. So now you got to go out and move your m- move your room mics so so they're less uh, brash. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Just just always thinking thinking ahead, I guess, about what what you're gonna need come mix time. Um, yeah, no, it's just good advice. You know, uh, don't be afraid to spot check something in the tracking yeah. to make sure you're doing the right thing. Right. Um, again, the hi hat bleed and a snare mic that can be a big one. Sometimes you go and you uh, you know you try and treat the snare later. You're trying to brighten it or you're trying to compress it or something, and you're like, oh, there's a lot of hi hat coming right. in. You didn't know it. Totally. But I like your suggestion too that when you're doing the parallel thing, you're sort of getting the excitement from that parallel track, but it's down so low that even though it might be accentuating the hi hat, it's not as much of a problem. And the natural one right. that is, has all the transient yeah. still doesn't, you know, you're not ex- exaggerating totally. something into becoming a problem. Yeah. Um, let's talk about bass. Bass. Never heard of it. Down D, funky D. Um, what do you do for bass uh, that that is really helpful at mix? Uh, at or, mi- or maybe start with the record if you want to make yep. sure you've you've got the right things, but but get to mix as quickly as we can. <laughs> yeah, uh, typically, I mean, in Nashville, there aren't too too many um, aren't too too many guys that show up with a bass amp. Um, so it's typically just a great sounding direct, and a lot of guys will literally have their own preamp and EQ and, and compression scheme um, that's ready to go. And and they walk in and they hand you an XLR out of the back of their rig and they say, right. take this. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Maybe let's talk about you know the the more of the challenges when you're recording bands and stuff like mm-hmm. Roswell Kid, for example, or the the 200 bands you recorded sure. uh, when you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But um, like, what are some things you learned about you know? So band comes in, it's like I'm rocking through my amp. That's my sound. Right. Um, how does that translate in the studio? Mm-hmm. Can you still get that sound out of a DI? Is it a little more challenging? Um, are there smart ways to uh, do you not even want a DI and you just want the amp? Typically, I'll always, um, I always prefer to get a DI. And and if it's if it's a band, I love taking bass amps. Uh, I, I love the sound of a bass yeah, amp. Yeah, I love the sound of, of air moving and I love the sound of- As long as it's not coming out of my speakers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, I love, um, I love how gnarly a bass amp can get. Um and I'll typically in mix, I'll use the, the DI for the sub sub stuff. Uh, 
and maybe a little bit of the tack. Um, but then I'll use the amp for kind of the, the mid range, uh, and kind of the, the dirt, uh, by either getting it at the, at the tracking stage, or if it's something, um, something that I'm delivered, um, then using some kind of, you know, uh, Halloween box as, uh, RS fields would call it, uh, to distort it or, um, something in the box to, to get some dirt out of it. That's a great name, man. The Halloween box. Yeah. It's, I'm don't you, don't you just that. got one of those Halloween boxes you can run it through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I love that. But, um, yeah. So if I don't have a base amp, um, if I'm delivered something to mix and it's just this, you know, kind of puny direct bass with no real, you know, they, they maybe it wasn't. Let's just come right out and say it. No real playing technique. Yeah. Or, or no real plan, you know, involved. It's just maybe just bass straight into this DI. Um, then I'll, I'll kind of just do a malt in the box and kind of create a bass amp or create uh, another signal that I will manipulate. Um, yeah, I would say actually reamping back out through a bass amp is something that I don't do enough. A lot of times mm-hmm. I might do a session, and and if the bass amp might have to share the room with a guitar, right? For the iso Just booth, say, you know, for some, for, yeah. And then and then you're getting cross talking. You're like, ah, I don't I don't want that. Yeah. But um, but reamping that bass one more time, even through the same bass amp, that's a tricky thing. Like some sometimes I feel like we'll sound check and get the bass amp to sound great. But then by the time the band's playing and rocking out and then you listen to it, you're like, ah, it's just not exactly no control. what I need. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the right kind of low end. Yeah. I, I, I don't get into, to reamping stuff too much. Maybe it's just out of laziness, but, um, well, it's, it's time consuming, you know, it sure. was like, how fast can you mix this? And, and like, I don't have a Do you want me amp. to set up an entire bass amp and, <laughs> and take the time to reamp every song? Uh, yeah. So, so typically I'll, I'll just try to, make some kind of parallel thing. I use the sound toys decapitator a lot, um, you know, and just roll out a lot of the sub sub stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, even, you know, 80 Hertz, hundred Hertz, take that all out of the thump bass switch amp. on or thump switch off. No thump thump off. Typically. I, I imagine the thump switch is like a resonant peak at the roll off. It sounds like, yeah, it, it sounds like it's, I mean, it's, it's low. It sounds like it's I don't know, 50, or something. Um, I also imagine that thump makes me think of drums. So maybe it's for the kick drum. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, on that, that bass malt, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to roll out a lot of the sub stuff and leave room for the sub, you know, the DI, which I feel like should be carrying most of the weight in the sub sub stuff. Um, and I'll use the, the amp uh, side of things or, or my faux amp side of things for, you know, 2k or something to to drive through and for some pick attack do you ever take a di it's funny you say that because it's it's true this the di tends to have the lowest of lows Mm -hmm. when you really pay attention to it even though it also has the shittiest of sounding mids sometimes you know on a rock thing Uh, but do you ever do any tricks where you're like you're actually rolling off everything above the subs on a DI to blend it in against a, a uh, bass amp? Sometimes. If I have a good enough sounding bass amp side of things, then yeah. Then in a, in a, all I need is just some, some sub yeah, subs. Just stuff. underneath that. Then yeah. yeah, take everything, you know, whatever, take everything above 1K or, or even further um, and just use that. Um, what are your thoughts about um, who gets the low end in a mix um, between the kick and the bass? Yeah, uh, how do you describe their interaction in lows? Yeah, I think it's it's different. It depends on, um, I guess it just depends on the um, on the program on, on the material who feels like they need to carry the most weight. Um, I like to say uh, bass guitar typically wins for me as as far as holding down the bottom bottom, um, but then you know. Of course, there is, you know, some like dancey numbers or, you know, some stuff where like that, the fundamentals should really be in this or the bass is being more. Um, so uh, if the bass is moving up the neck, that just yeah. sort of goes away sometimes, doesn't it? Which have you, have you used that, um, I believe it's from a company called Soundradix called Surfer EQ. 
I know about it. Is that, that one that follows the bass notes or something yes, like that? Yes, yeah, it kind of tracks to whatever program you, you put through it. And uh, that is typically a go-to on my bass DI side. Um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, so you'll have several boosts and cuts uh, that you have happening that are kind of locked to, you know, maybe the key of the tune, and then it'll it'll follow it. So wherever the fundamental is of whatever note that is, because typically bass being a monophonic instrument, only one note at a time, yeah, it can track that pretty easily. Know, you ever soled my bass tracks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let's talk about that for a sec. So that is one thing that as an engineer and as a producer, you begin to discover, yeah. which isn't obvious to, at first, is the level of not paying attention that we instinctively, you know, that we naturally do mm -hmm. in playing bass. One of the things that happens, especially in those low lows, is a bass player will switch between the E and the A string playing different notes right. and not realize that, that the string that they're not playing, it's still just ringing through there a little bit. And it's oh, yeah. dropping in a fundamental that's like clashing with the note you're playing. Yeah, totally. Or it's not getting out of the way. And that, that becomes a technique thing that you... Um, hopefully learn once you hit the studio as a bass player. Yeah. Or, you know, once you, yeah, if you, if you have enough mileage, uh, underneath a set of headphones, you know, that has a, a good sounding. I like that mileage underneath in the headphones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you got enough mileage, uh, uh, underneath them and, and you, you've heard yourself, you know, kind of under the microscope, you'll, you'll make those adjustments pretty quick, you know. Yeah, especially when you begin to solo the the bass and really notice it. Mm -hmm. So Rockstars, I just encourage you to to look for that. When you first discover it, um, it's really m kind of mind-blowing. You're like, oh, man, I had no idea. It's like the all the power in, you know, the first few chords of your chorus, for example, mm -hmm. might be missing just by, just because of the fact that somebody – is right. leaving a string ringing a little bit on the bass. Right. It's know? just, yeah, just, just taking the attention away from, from the star. Um, um, any other tricks for you? Uh, how about balancing the right level of the bass in your mix? Where do you go for that? Um, a lot of times, like, like we were talking about earlier, I, I don't have, um, you know, my speakers will go very, very low, um, but they, they just don't have the power and they can't push the air, um, sometimes for me to really, really be able to crank it up and feel where the bass needs to be. A lot of times I'll go under cans uh, to make those decisions um, about the bass or I'll go to which, the little... Which ones do you talking about? Your headphones, which ones do you use for doing that? The the Tascam T20s or something the else? The Fostex, yeah. The Fostex, oh, the Fostex, uh, Fostex T20s. T20s, which, you know, like they're a darker set of cans, but they're they're not typically known for having like great, great sub bass response, but, um, I just know them and I know how they'll break up if they're, if they're hit too hard, or I know how the, the headphone will kind of get overwhelmed if there's too much bottom end and something. Um, so yeah, going under cans, listening super low or listening on a, um, like that little radio speaker that I have, uh, you know, just listening for, listening for problems, basically, you know. In All right, so here's here's a question for you. Um, let's say you've got your mix to where you're like, that's got to be enough bass. I don't want more low end in my mix than that because it's going to spoil things. But when I go on the little speaker, I'm not really reading the bass. Yeah. Um, is that something, a challenge that you address? And, and are there any tricks for how to address that? Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe it's not – Maybe what you're missing is maybe not necessarily in the bass guitar territory. Maybe it's the the lower end of the electrics that you know are are, um, are missing a little bit of power, or maybe it's the lower end of even those drum room mics. Those tend to carry a lot of weight for me. Um, is you know a lot of the like I don't know one fifty two hundred even uh, in, in in your drum room mics that, um, you know, like take up a lot of that lower, lower mid, uh, space. So, so it's kind of the message is, um, don't worry about it. It's not the bass guitar. It's the other instruments that are yeah, or maybe, needing you know, to add something right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. M mute the bass and, and see what it sounds like then. Right. I, I spend a lot of time just 
randomly muting, maybe not randomly, but muting different elements and like, okay, what is this really doing for right, me? Right, right. Uh, and if, okay, this is what this is really doing for me. This is carrying this kind of uh, movement or, or, you know, like rhythm, uh, then, then you'll, you'll be more informed to make better decisions if, you know, it just, it's, it sheds a lot of light on things when you, when you take them away. How often do you um, start adding, you know, maybe like a gentle EQ to the, uh, some of the upper frequencies on a bass, like the 200 to 500 and 800 range? Do you find mm -hmm. those to be useful frequencies for, for mixing the bass? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of good stuff up there. Um, you know, and especially with like rock and roll bands or, or saturated bass guitars, there's a lot of information to be had. Um, I work, uh, with a band called anti-flag, uh, quite a bit. And their bass player, Chris is s sort of got a, uh, you know, an, an infamous, uh, sound he, of, of having a very, very mid rangey high endy bass, um, you know, that's very distorted, very, and he's very busy. He's all up over the, the dusty part of the fretboard. <laughs> the dusty part of the fretboard. Um, I, I totally know exactly what you mean. Too. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> so, you know, like there, there's a lot of information to be had up there and it's you're a You're saying very, his left hand is getting way too close to his right hand, is what you're saying? <laughs> right. Yeah. They're almost touching. Um, so in, uh, in that band's case, that's a very important range in, in the bass guitar is is the upper mids. Um, um, when you're doing, when you're producing, I mean, I guess, you know, on, on a band like Anti-Flag, um, there may not be room for production decisions to re-add lows in on something with another instrument. Mm -hmm. But maybe in some other cases, when, when the bass guitar does want to go up the neck and we're losing... You know, sometimes it, sometimes the bass goes up in a chorus, yeah. but you still need weight. Totally. Um, what are you? What do you find are some useful ways to get that back into a chorus? Um, well, it, I mean, in that uh, band's case, I have gone back and added another bass guitar to where it's just playing the the uh, root. You know, oh, cool! And it's just going in. Um, and it's just, a clever way to do it, so it doesn't sound like it. Like all, like who who invited the who let the keyboard player into the band, right? And it, yeah, and, and it doesn't sound like um, yeah. You, you never really notice, or you never really perceive that like oh, there's two bases going on here. It's just the bottom end didn't leave when he went up and started doing his bits up, up here. Do you um, find it's useful for him to play the same rhythmic phrasing on that uh, low note, his, or is it more like his, whole notes his, or something? As his regular bass, yeah. Track. As the yeah. So if he's busy up high, does the low addition try and use the same rhythmic busyness, or does it? Does no, it, is I would it say simpler the, to stick with the guitars. You are with the yeah. Where wherever they're at, just follow that uh, on the root notes and make you know make yourself unnoticeable. Right. Right. Basically, you know, blending just make in it, with what the guitar wall's doing. Or yeah, something. just yeah. make it it sound like an addition to uh, the guitars, and the guitars get bigger in that section not necessarily that another bass comes in. You know? And is that an overdub you might do pretty quickly right after the take? Um, well, with them, I've uh, come to think, I don't think I've ever had them in the studio. I've had various members in a couple different bands in the studio, but but them as a band, I have never tracked. I've only mixed a handful of records of theirs, and they're in Pittsburgh, so it's always been a, a so kind do you of... Just like see, do you just like quietly pull a bass off the wall and... Yeah, well, not Start me. I call up my... a buddy of mine and, and <laughs> say, hey, I, "Hey, you want some beer? There you go. <laughs> um, beer for bass. Yeah, come over here and uh, and uh, lay this one down." And um, they're typically thrilled to do that because that's typically not a, a thing that. Um, well, it turns out it's fun to make music, they rock get and to, roll, especially. <laughs> yeah, it's not a thing that they get to play on um, often in town here, so they're 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 thrilled to do it. But yeah, typically I'll just have somebody come over and, and try to lay it down. Awesome. What are your favorite ways to treat electric guitars for a band like Roswell Kid? Um, how do you handle electric guitars and acoustic guitars differently also on Americana records? Mm -hmm. um, well, Roswell Kid specifically, um, they have just such great tones going in. Um, and, you know, Jordan, the, the singer, uh, 
rhythm guitar player is not um it's not what you call a uh, a tone chaperone or a savant tone chaperone <laughs> um uh, by any means but he has he he has a way to make his guitar sounds super interesting and it's just you just want to listen to it um Adam Meisterhans, the lead guitar player from that band, um, is, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, a, has such a great technical knowledge. Of, he's a guitar player's guitar player, and he's, you know, uh, has a, a thirst for for finding new, uh, new pedals, new amps, new guitars, you know, um, stuff, and has that, you know, almost a more traditional hi-fi rock guitar sound. Um but their sounds going in are, are always so great. So um, does that mean it's easy to just, we're talking like the, when you got a great sound, you're looking at just a single 57 on, on each amp or something like that? Yeah, I think for them, um, I think maybe I did a, a 57 in a, an Audio Technica 4047 um, on each one of them. I love the low end of of those 4047s and they're and the audio technic is either a large dif- diaphragm or a medium diaphragm condenser, condenser. right? Yeah. Um, and then I, I always find one of the benefits, uh, or one of the, uh, features of a condenser mic that might be useful if I'm going to try and add it to an, a guitar amp is that it has a pad switch on it. Oh yeah. Usually you're pretty loud. Yeah. Coming yeah. Off yeah the you're amp, normally right? pretty rocking. Um, yeah, either the either the mic craps out at that level, or it's it's way too much for your preamp. So I always carry you know a, a case full of ten inline pads, twenty nice. dB pads. That nice. Typically, de facto, Do you I wear always, them like a like an ammo belt over your like Rambo <laughs> right. over your shoulders. Yeah. Over I love the I love the types of engineers that that travel and they have like such nerdy things like that. You know, they've got like pouches with like. Uh, nerve tonic in it, or they've yeah. got you know like they're they're Fan, fanny sack. They're they're also called cock sacks, I think, yeah. because they often like go in front, you know. <laughs> cock sack, nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, electric guitar. There, there's um, we did a lot of uh, room mic stuff for the Roswell Kid thing. We you know again we were in a great wood sounding room. Uh, typically, we would open the doors up to the guitars and let some of that into the drum room. So there was some of that ambience. Um, While the drums were tracking, because you were tracking them live. Yeah, we were all, we were doing so you it get live. Like, you get enough control, but then now you can start controlling how much of the bleed you let back into the sound. Right, yeah. And just like, I remember, you know, us doing a couple different takes where we propped the door open to a couple varying degrees and saw what we liked, you know, what we liked best. Um, and we made a decision. Um, the... A lot of the a lot of the lead stuff uh, of any of the guitars that were overdubbed on that record was, believe it or not, one of those little like Marshall like belt amps. Like, oh yeah, uh, whatever you call them. Um, but those like a lot of the lead guitars that you know like they sound so big they came from this tiny little thing, and I don't know what the secret to that is, but we thought it was funny to use them, so. We- <laughs> So, it's a direct distortion. You know? Yeah, I mean, so that, I guess, that was an overdub. Was those little amps? And were you micing the amp or a little direct out thing? Uh, no, we were micing it. Just like stick a fifty-seven on it, and the fifty-seven, you know, the the front of the fifty-seven is about as big as the speaker. Yeah, is Yeah, totally. On that I've got thing. a little um, the cigarette box amps. I've got yeah. one of those, and same thing. And the funny thing is that cigarette box amp has a speaker output, and it can drive a four twelve cabinet. Wow, not very loudly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I don't know if I'm going to use it that way, but uh, but it's fun to explore that stuff. That is, I, I say this, and I'll, I'll just keep saying it, the exploration of sounds before it gets into the computer is something that tends to disappear because it's so possible to get, you know, to, to do so many things in the computer. And mm-hmm. then, you know, if you're if you're feeling time crunch, it's one of the first things that you sort of like, yeah, we'll do it later. We'll do it later or something like that. Yeah. But it really is one of those defining things that helps make great records sound great. I think so. Yeah. I encourage, or unique. encourage us and, and you rock stars to um, spend more time exploring what the possibilities are outside of the computer before you even capture it. Right. You'll be happy about it later. And that's the same can be said for pre-production. I think that's one of, if not the most important part of, 
uh, of tracking a record is making sure that it's right going in. And remembering what the hell you decided by the time you're in the studio. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, Actually, how do you do that? How do you do pre-production and then make sure that those ideas don't get forgotten once you hit the studio? Uh, I mean, you take a, a crude uh, work tape of whatever it was, wherever y'all were rehearsing. Uh, you know, like a lot of times you don't have the luxury of like doing pre-production in the same place that you're tracking. Um but if you are, you know, like just put – it doesn't have to be fancy, just a room mic or whatever. Just throw it up so you so you get the arrangements down. And once you get it feeling a certain way, then it's like, okay, now we know what that tempo was that felt so good. Or now we know, um, yeah, this arrangement feels great. Or, or, or we know what's not going to work. It's like, yeah, everything feels great from that pre-production demo, but um, – it, you know, it feels a little busy in the second verse with somebody yeah. needs, you know, something else needs to happen there. It also helps um, because in pre-production you can be like, well, let's try this arrangement. Well, let's try that arrangement. Well, let's, yeah. what if we do this in the intro? What if we don't do that in the intro, right. you know? Um, you and and you're not wearing everybody out at the same time. Cause if you're worn out at the end of pre-production, that just means you did it right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, you should <laughs> but be if you're worn out. out at the end of, you know, when you're just getting ready to record the take in the studio, it probably means you did it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so for, for band stuff, I, I love being a part of, of the pre-production and, and just brainstorming about, um, just where, where, where this should go, you know, like how, from, from my perspective, um, sonically kind of what kind of landscape you think is going to be uh painted and obviously it's very beneficial to them too to work out you know arrangements and work on their uh own tones and hear how when you hear it back you're hearing how things are interacting with one another and um yeah i think it's it's hugely beneficial well i mean it's just there's that's a better opportunity and a better time to to begin to educate the bass player that and the the kick uh, the drummer as to, you know, Stay on the same what, page. what happens if, if you guys play the kick and the bass at the same time, you know? Yeah. And what if we do it like this? You yeah. Know, kind and of it's thing. a lot cheaper typically to get that stuff sussed out yeah. beforehand. Yeah, indeed. Uh, being, being in Nashville, we're, we're a lot of times so spoiled and, you know, especially coming up kind of in music row, they're mostly uh, any session that, that I was doing coming up, they were all hired session players, you know, they were double scale. Yeah. And they know how to, this is stuff they know when they, they come in with and their done a million times before and they, they, their tone is putting out, you know, their rig is putting out a perfectly tuned, you know, drum set and here you go. And they'll uh, oftentimes know better than you where to put the mic. Uh, on, yeah. On their I rig. ask them when a you musician know? is like, if they bring in an instrument, I'm not sure. I'm like, Hey, do you have any favorite spots? Yeah. You know? Yeah. What's your take Won't on Don't hesitate this? on a guitar or a bass or, um, pedal steel. You know, it's like, sure. Yeah. Cause they, they probably know they probably get stuff. And, and if their instrument comes back to them sounding a little funny, it's going to be distracting too, you know? Mm -hmm. I know there was a guy, funny, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> there was a guy, um, that, uh, would tell me that, uh, you know, he would go around and he would kind of just whenever, you know, maybe, maybe on a break or something, if his amp was sounding a little funny to him, he wouldn't move the microphone, but he would move his amp. You know, so it's like the engineer would ask, you know, like, man, did you, did you change something? Did that mic get moved? It's like, no, the mic's exactly where it was, <laughs> he but he was would just, he would move time. the amp in front of the mics to, oh, to get what, what he wanted. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's, uh, we're, we're coming to, to the wrap up point here, but let's talk about what you like to do with the stereo mix. Now you've got your instruments, um, coming out, uh, and, and you're about to hit your stereo bus. Mm -hmm. What do you like to do then? I know um, you talked about this new, this new dangerous box, but you know since you haven't had a whole lot of time on that, what what do you like to do if you're still in the box? You know, yeah. Well, the um, I do a a lot of mostly in the box processing on on the stereo bus, and um, there's a lot of stuff on there. Um, typically, I'll, I'll first and foremost hit some kind of saturation. Um, there's one um, I think it's from Fab Filter. What's the Fab Filter one called? Saturn, is that it? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, I'll hit it with that. You know, something super light, but something that just gives a little bit overall harmonic information to kind of fill in a little bit of the dead space in between the notes. Um, do that typically, um, I don't know what follows that, is maybe some kind of, uh, oh, you know, I've, I've been using this um, 
plugin called Golfos. Have you heard of that? Yeah, but I haven't used it yet. It's also kind of like a a intuitive corrective EQ type thing that um, it it can do. You know, like up to three hundred moves a second or something something crazy. Um, and it I found it especially useful uh, if you have a like a fiddle or violin player who's kind of like moving around in the chair. Uh, it'll kind of always keep the same tonal balance, you know, like even if, if your source is, is changing. Um, so I found it highly useful on that. And it, and you, this would go on the stereo bus? Or yeah, this? but okay. it also does great things on the stereo on, bus yeah. to where um, it, it analyzes it. And there's some, you know, crazy algorithm with the way the human ear works and what is fatiguing to them or what, you know, if there's a buildup somewhere, it will kind of, demonstrate that has got a beautiful uh, visual representation of that too. And you can say, you know, you can either recover some stuff that maybe isn't in this, in this mix that, you know, it's being shown, or you can kind of tame some stuff. If there's a big old buildup, you know, at 800, it'll kind of illustrate that for you and you can kind of see the difference. Uh, so I've, I've been loving that on stereo bus lately. I'm just, I was circling three plugins that you mentioned on this. You talked about the surfer EQ, which was uh-huh. great. Um, the golf, golf Foss, golf Foss, yeah. golf Foss plugin, which is exciting. Yeah. And then of course, fab filter, just another reminder that they've got a whole suite of great plugins. Oh yeah. They yeah. get brought up a lot on the yeah, podcast. Their stuff too. is so great. The, the EQ is, is my, you know, kind of just my go-to, um, their pro Q. Yeah. Pro Q um, too is what I've been using. And, uh, yeah, it's great. The filters are great on them. They're they're so easy to use. It's great to be able to sidechain, um, you know, a, a bass drum. You know, uh, sidechain the visual of a bass guitar while you're EQing a bass drum to know where they're overlapping and what you know, like maybe the strong points of each element and kind of carving around to kind of create that puzzle. But yeah, their stuff is great. Uh, and then. Uh, I love uh, I love uh, all the isotope stuff. Ozone is great on mm-hmm. a master bus. They've got mm-hmm. a bunch of different modules in there. Um, do you find that you use a bunch of different modules, or do you is your first move pull it up, go turn off all the modules, and start with the one that you think you need, and then yeah, then maybe typically I'm, I'll I'll leave them all off and I'll I'll insert them all um, and see if they're doing you know see if they're doing what I need them to do. Um, that EQ match thing is great uh, if you're going for a specific. Um, specific uh kind of territory that you feel like you need to land in they've got a great like imaging um like stereo widener thing on there which is awesome and this is all stuff that's on my instrumental Uh, interesting right Uh, so so none of this stuff is is really affecting the lead vocal or the wet you know the verbs and delays glad you um this is all just the dry instrumental uh portion um yeah, I, just, I think that's it for... It's like you're gluing the band together. Right, yeah. You just put everybody in the same space. Um, also, typically, I'll have just one aux with some kind of room emulation, like the that Ocean Way room emulator from UAD is great. Um, and I'll literally copy to send the entire band to that um, room and roll out a little bit of bass, but then just tuck that in and kind of just make sure everybody feels like they're in the same room, even if they weren't or if they were dubbed in at separate times or whatever. I think that's it. That's sweet. And what was the plugin you were referencing there? Uh, It was the Ocean Way Room Modeler uh, from UAD. Um, So all their stuff is is pretty amazing. That's cool. Um, And then um, what about compression or limiting? Is that stuff that makes it onto your stereo bus? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, And it it depends what... um, what type of project it is. It, it may need to be some kind of soft, you know, like to be Fairchild type thing uh, to kind of just give it a little bit of a... Of what do you a, reach for when you want to get that kind of sound? Um, I love the the UAD Fairchild 670 is great. Um, yeah, typically that's what I would go for. Or the, the Shadow Hills uh, mastering compressor is great for, for that type of thing. Um, kind of slow... Uh, rolled off, round sounding. Um, if I want aggressive, you know, uh, you can go for a pair of distressors, or you can go for. Um, you can know, you just start yelling at your computer? And yeah, get you just start shaking the monitor. <laughs> um, 
or you know, 33609 are great, or the SSL bus compressors. Awesome. And those are all the UAD ones that. So you really, uh, yeah, you're, or you're the really waves, UAD fan. The wave stuff is great too. Um, I just uh, I, I've got an Apollo in in one of those uh, extra DSP boxes, so I, it takes a lot of the processing off my computer if I use if I yeah. use those. Um, so I I do tend to use a lot of UAD stuff. Um, but yeah. Uh, I guess that's about it. And I mean, kind of the typical stuff for my vocal bus and and the effects bus, um, depending on the type of vocal it is, if I need it to be more aggressive, typically at the end of the vocal chain, there's some kind of limiter that's, you know, very lightly, but bringing everything up together. And these are all the vocals going through the same bus. Um, so I can globally bring them up or bring them down. Um, yeah, that's good thinking. Yeah. And then the... Uh, the effects bus is typically has like a Pultec with some super high end uh, put onto it, and then a uh, like a stereo widener to kind of just make all your wide effect stuff try to yeah, make it even wider. Wide. Yeah, interesting. Which the stereo wideners you have to be careful with, yeah. especially on like a, a traditional mix bus situation. Now, what about do you find that that's competing with your ability to have a mono delay or slap going behind an instrument or a vocal or something? Uh, no. To, a, a lot of times I'll, um, like I've got a Roland space echo that, that I'll send the vocal out, um, to, and, and print back in that's like, you know, a little spring verb and a, a mono delay and that's tucked right up in there with the, um. So even if you add a little bit of the widening effect, it doesn't mess up your mono effect that you're at. That no. You're and sometimes out. I'll, I'll send that stuff like the, like the, um, the space echo, vocal i'll send out the vocal bus not the not the one that's going to the widening right yeah good you call know. good call and, and, and like i'll i'll send you know if all it's the stereo really stuff. part of the vocal send if it's glued right keep then it yeah with the treat it just like it's it's because if you of turned the up the vocal sound. and that didn't turn up with it it would have sounded, yeah it would alter the vocal the, would have sounded wrong all of a sudden right yeah cool. um, all right well we're we should wrap up here but let me um uh give you one more question here um this one's hypothetical. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back and take the the Wayback Studio Machine. Gotcha. And uh, you've done a lot of, you know, you started out, had your 200 bands and uh, your 10,000 hours, probably, yeah. at that point. And then scrapped it all, went to school, came back to Nashville, did a little music row. Mm -hmm. Now you're, now you're rocking everybody's world from a log cabin, which is yeah. pretty awesome. <laughs> and um, if you could go back in time and, and find your young self, and give yourself one bit of advice and go, listen, dude, you need to do this one. This is the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one yeah. day. What advice do you think you'd go back and give yourself? Hmm. Um, I wish somebody could give me that advice now. I, <laughs> you know, uh, who's, who's older and wiser than, than I am, you know. Um, Future Justin to the yeah, rescue. I'm like, who am I to be giving advice to? me um i would say don't 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 be afraid to to be drastic with things i, I think a lot of of younger engineers are are afraid to um you know they're they're afraid of of you know there, there's so many visual elements in what we do now you know a, a gain reduction meter going into red or something is is scary you know or or a um yeah, a, a preamp going into red or, or a, you know, like doing, you feel like a, a drastic EQ curve. This looks crazy. Uh, yeah, that's a I big one for this. me. That's um, a big one for me is like, um, sometimes I, I go for the EQ and I'm like, I'm just going to close my eyes because if I look at the screen, I'm not going to do right. what I want to do. Or you, you drift back to, you know, like the Rolodex in your head of like, okay, what's a, what's a kick drum EQ curve supposed to look like? Right. Let's start there. You know, and it's like, just, you know, listen to it and see what... Rolodex be damned! Yeah. <laughs> Get out of my head. Um, yeah, so, so so don't be afraid to to do something that's unconventional. And, and that's what, you know, like, even, you know, the past couple years, I, I've been learning to get out of the notion that um, things have to be done this way or this is, this is the way it's always been done or, you know whatever it, it's if it sounds good it is good right that was a, a quote that that um always kind of comes back to me if it sounds good 
It is good. Yep. It doesn't matter what you're doing to it. It doesn't matter if you're going through three different preamps at the same time, you know, and, and it's coming out all mangled. If it sounds good, it is good. Yeah, um, I agree. It's like there's no such thing as a bad sound um, or, or even a good and bad sound. There's just simply, you know, the good and bad times to be using that sound. Yeah, yeah. It, and yeah you it, it, one, you know, like that sound may be terrible for this production, but it may be the perfect one for another one. And at least then you'll know how to get to it yeah. or you'll know, you know. You'll know what to do or, more importantly, what not to do. <laughs> so, Rockstars, don't be afraid to forget everything you learned on this podcast yeah. <laughs> in that moment where you need to make a decision. And then remember it right after that. Right. Um, so, uh, Justin, thank you so much for being on Recording thank Studio Rockstars me. with us. Super pleasure having you come over. Um, Appreciate the time. And hanging with you. And, and it really, like, uh, I feel like we really opened up in the second half here and got into some really good stuff. So, yeah. thanks for doing that. Um, let the Rockstars know how they can find you online. And, uh if they need to come make their next record with you, how do they reach out to you? Yeah, uh, I'm on the internet. Uh, I got a website. It's uh, www.jryanfrancis.com. Um, I'm on the Instagram at the same handle, jryanfrancis. Um, and I am I'm around and uh, can be easily gotten to. Right on, dude. Well, thank you for being on the show. Rockstar, as a reminder, we've got stuff we're going to talk about here. A link to the website a YouTube player with and uh, Spotify players as well in the blog post. So, and in the show notes, so just click right through. If you're on your mobile device, you can swipe up and get right over to the full show notes there. Um, or just go to rsrockstars.com, search for Justin Francis and get ready to rock. Dude, we'll see you around the studio, man. Thanks. Thanks again. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. <laughs>